Good afternoon. Welcome. Well, my name is Eric Patterson. I joined the team here at the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation on Monday of this week. And it's a delight to welcome you here to this important event. At VOC, our mission is to educate future generations about the ideology, the history, and the legacy of communism, and to advocate for freedom for those who are still held captive by communist regimes around the world. And there's no better person to kick us off today as we talk about two great statesmen, the men who bookended the Cold War and the victory over the Soviet Union and its influence at the time, Churchill and Reagan. There's no one better to kick us off today than the founding chairman of our board, Dr. Lee Edwards. Dr. Edwards is the founding chairman of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation and recipient of our Truman Reagan Medal in 2022. For over 20 years, he was a distinguished fellow in conservative thought at the B. Kenneth Simon Center for American Studies at the Heritage Foundation. As you know, he's a great friend, a great intellectual leader on these issues. Would you help me in welcoming Dr. Lee Edwards? <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you, Eric. And uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, everyone. And welcome to our discussion of the greatest statesmen of the 20th century, Winston Churchill and Ronald Reagan. And I know that nobody here is going to dispute that characterization. They were the greatest. The parallels between these two leaders are amazing. And I'm just going to take a minute or two before we turn it over to our panelists. Listen to this. Churchill was the first leader in the West to declare that an iron curtain of communism had descended across Europe. Reagan was the first leader to predict that communism was headed for the ash heap of history. Both were roundly criticized and dismissed by their peers. Both were called warmongers. Both understood the deadly danger of appeasement. Both experienced political defeat in their early careers, but made remarkable comebacks. Both were irrepressible optimists, and thank heavens that they were, who turned to the people in a time of crisis. Both possessed extraordinary insight able to foresee what others could not. Churchill, for example, predicted the rise of Hitler, Reagan, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Both appealed to the better angels of our nature. Churchill and Reagan were historic leaders because they were great communicators of great ideas, especially the greatest political ideal of all, freedom. Both believed with Vaclav Havel in the power of words to change history. And because of their leadership, we can come together this morning, this afternoon, to discuss how Churchill and Reagan use words to preserve what we hold most dear, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Turn it back over to you, Karen. Thank you very much. Let me just say a few words about how the afternoon will progress. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to hear from our keynote speaker, and then we will follow his remarks with a panel. And then that will be followed by a second panel, and there'll be some time for Q&A. I just lost my notes from the podium, uh, so I'm going to grab them in just a moment. But I do want to just say this thing for those of us who are in the room. As you know, there's coffee and water and things right outside. And you know where the other facilities are. This is a program with no breaks. And so yeah, we're, we're going to proceed with the content directly. And as you need to get another glass of water or coffee or something, please do and just come in and out that way as needed. Well, our keynote address today is by Dr. Stephen Hayward. Many of you know him as a distinguished scholar at UC Berkeley in California. Is that correct? Yeah. And, uh, and with, a, uh, with a scholar in residence position in what used to be called Bolt Hall, now Berkeley 
Law School. And we're delighted that he came in from the West Coast last night, despite the vicissitudes of weather and a missed airline flight. Uh, would you help me welcome Dr. Stephen Hayward? Well, th excuse me while I get my Churchill glasses on here. Uh, well, thank you for that kind introduction. I'm really thrilled to be here. I mean, I've known about this project uh, in being for quite a long time, but then I've been gone from Washington for almost 15 years now. So I had not been around for the step-by-step -step progress to get here. And so it's really thrilling to see it uh, in, in the flesh and, and more from here. Uh, let's set the scene generally, though, for a moment. Uh, it's now 35 years on since the Berlin Wall came down. 33, 32 years since the Soviet Union ended its existence. And so it's kind of faded into the mists and is really unappreciated by younger generations, I think, that the conventional view of the Cold War, including during and all the way to the end of that climactic last decade, is that the Cold War was a permanent feature of the world. The Soviet Union was here forever. It wasn't going to be going away. We had to figure out some way to manage it. And that was true across the political spectrum. There were some differences between the parties and schools of thought, but Kissinger certainly thought that the Soviet Union was around forever. Uh, it was ludicrous to suggest that this could be ended or that the Soviet Union would be defeated. Uh, and, and of course, <laughs> Kissinger, who just departed us recently, was always under just suspicion that he thought the job was to lose slowly. Uh, a lot of conventional might say Chamber of Commerce Republicans didn't really have the right appreciation of things. And the great words of Norman Podhoretz, your basic Chamber of Commerce Republican thought the Soviet Union was the Federal Trade Commission with nuclear weapons. Uh, among more liberals, they clung to a theoretical idea of convergence, which was, yeah, they're sort of mean and bureaucratic and tyrannical and they have the gulag, but sooner or later they'll mellow and we'll, we'll sort of have a convergence between the two countries and, and the enmity and, and differences will disappear, from which came the idea that the way to solve our problems was to try to convert our political differences into technical differences. That's the premise of arms control. If we just do numbers of launchers and types of warheads, that's how we'll reduce Cold War tension. And the core insight of Reagan and Churchill, almost alone, is that, no, that's completely wrong. This is fundamentally a moral struggle. And until you make that the first principle of policy, there will be no progress of any kind. And in the course of doing research for, you know, it ended up being a 700-page book on the Reagan presidency, I got curious that, gosh, Reagan quotes Churchill an awful lot. And not, by the way, just the quips and jests. I mean, quoting Churchill, as has been observed, is a bipartisan requirement of American politics. Presidents of both parties do it. Uh, I remember Pamela Harriman saying, remember who was Randolph Churchill's first wife, Pamela Harriman saying that Bill Clinton reminded her of Churchill. And I thought, well, it's true. Neither one of them served in Vietnam. I guess there's that in common. Um, but otherwise, it was kind of a reach, you know. Um, uh, but Reagan quoted a lot of the substantive things that Churchill said, not just the you know, familiar things that we know about, some very obscure. And then with the magic of modern word searches, I discovered that Reagan quoted Churchill more often than every other American president combined. And that goes back to Hoover. Hoover was the first American president to quote Churchill. And that's before, of course, Churchill's fame as prime minister. And by the way, if you're curious, we know John F. Kennedy was very fond of Churchill. I extrapolated a Churchill quotation rate over a theoretical two terms of John F. Kennedy, and Reagan still beat him by quite a bit. So I thought, well, that's interesting. And then the more I looked, and then Lee's already hinted at something, that the remarkable similarities be between the two of them. And it's not just in their insights, which I'll come to at the core of things here, but also certain aspects of their character. And even really their family stories. Now, very different family background. Churchill from an aristocratic family. Uh, Reagan from a you know, downwardly mobile, struggling working class family. Um, uh, but, and you think Churchill, the lifelong statesman, and Reagan, an actor most of his life, who came to politics later on. Of course, on the other hand, from his earliest days in politics, Churchill's friends and his critics would say, Winston, you missed your calling in life. You should have been an actor. And you may know that Reagan, in one of his final interviews in 1989 with David Brinkley, said that he didn't know how anyone could be president 
uh, who was not an actor in some In other words, they both understood the dramatic requirements of modern democratic mass media politics. Uh, by the way, Churchill was fascinated with the movie business. He spent some time with Charlie Chaplin in 1929 and proposed writing some movie scripts for him. So maybe not so far apart uh, in certain ways between these two men. Um, you may know the family story. Uh, both adored their fathers, but were considerably distant from them. Both talked about their mothers as being the uh, most important influence in their life. Churchill say, my mother shone for me like the evening star, but from a distance, less distance for, for Reagan. Um, both of them talked about their spouses in the same way. Uh, the last sentence of Churchill's book, My Early Life, says, uh, I married Clementine Hosier and lived happily ever afterward. And maybe you've seen this very thick book of letters from Winston to Clementine that's out a few years ago. Very sentimental and romantic. Um, Reagan, we have some of his notes uh, to Nancy, even published through the years. And Reagan liked to say at dinners and things, uh, and I'll quote him here, along came Nancy Reagan and saved my soul. Or think about their fondness for horses expressed in similar ways. Both were member of the Army Cavalry, uh, keep in mind. Churchill wrote, no one ever came to grief except honorable grief through riding horses. No hour of life is lost that is spent in the saddle. And Reagan is famous for saying, there is nothing quite so good for the inside of a man than the outside of a horse. And reporters all thought that Reagan came up with that. It's actually from Xenophon's Art of Horsemanship, but doesn't matter. The fundamental point is the, is the important thing. Uh, we all know, of course, that Reagan uh, survived the assassin's bullet very bravely in 1981. When he finally came clear of anesthesia, really a couple days later, still with a, a respiratory tube in his mouth, he scribbled on the notepad Churchill's famous line, there's nothing more exhilarating than being shot at without result. <laughs> Although not quite literally true, there was some result from that. Of he nearly died, right? It took months recovering in great pain. Um, Churchill, of course, nearly killed by being hit by a car on Fifth Avenue in 1932, I think, Jim, when he looked the wrong way around that time. Um, 31. I knew you would know. You could probably tell me the day and time of day. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I knew it. 76th <laughs> Street. Boy, tough crowd, as they say in the comedy clubs. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, uh, remember that both men were party switchers, and for the same reason. And in fact, throughout the 80s, a lot of Democrats switched parties in the 80s, and Reagan often had a ceremony at the White House to welcome a new Republican party member. And he would he always quote Churchill, saying, some men change their principles for their party, other men change their party for their principles. But then as you get deeper into politics, you start to say that some of these seemingly superficial things, certain parallels of their life stories and character, may have a relation to their political practice and political insight. I don't know, can't be proven. But one other, I think, really important parallel to keep in mind is that neither man was the choice of their party to be their leader at moments of crisis. In 1940, Churchill was the last person the Conservative Party wanted as prime minister. And it was really only the Labor Party that put him over the top, by most accounts. And in 1980, uh, if we'd had the old smoke-filled room, surely the Republican establishment would have picked Gerald Ford or Howard Baker or George Bush ahead of Reagan. Uh, Charles Percy said that uh, when Reagan was nominated that this was a foolhardy idea. He said Reagan's nomination will signal the beginning of the end of our party as an effective force in American political life. In 1940, my favorite quote from this is the cabinet secretary, John Colville. He said this, in May 1940, the mere thought of Churchill as prime minister sent a cold chill down the spines of the staff working at 10 Downing Street. Seldom can a prime minister have taken office with the establishment so dubious of the choice and so prepared to find its doubts justified. And other senior members of the Tory party were saying Churchill's not going to last five months. Among other things, they said he's too old at 65. His time has passed. Reagan's case was equally shocking. Uh, I like to quote uh, the late John P. Roach, an interesting man, a thoughtful liberal, former head of the Americans for Democratic Action, who later became quite an admirer of Reagan, by the way. He wrote, quote, Reagan's election was an eight plus earthquake on the political Richter scale. And it sent a number of eminent statesmen, Republican and Democratic, into shock. 
And I've got a whole lot of long list I won't go through now of all the people saying there's no way he can possibly succeed. And all the reasons why, among which were he's going to be 70 years old in a couple of months. That's way too old to be president. Just kind of a ironic and amusing just now. Um, but I think what set them apart from the rest of their party was, I guess you'd put it this way, their iconoclasm, born of the fact that they were had utterly independent minds. They always dissented, not just from liberal orthodoxy, but from their own party's orthodoxy, like, as I say, on the Cold War. It emerged later, of course, Reagan saying, my view of the Cold War is we win and they lose, which he never articulated publicly because I think he understood how radical that would sound, maybe even frightening. I mean, he went as far as saying several times that, you know what, everyone says we should be afraid of an arms race. I'm paraphrasing here, but why be afraid of a race that we're going to win and that they're going to lose? You can't say that. You couldn't say that then. That was just a heresy. But he was willing to go that far in his public statements. Because I think he thought it was necessary to start sending those signals to the Soviet Union that we we're not going to play the game by the old rules. You can think of other things, by the way. I mean, another parallel, I think, on politics was in the early 30s, late 20s, early 30s, Churchill opposed the dominion status for India, which caused a very big breach with his party that looks very much like Reagan's opposition to the Panama Canal Treaty in the 1970s, a big breach with his own party also. Um, and they split their parties over those issues, right? So what accounts for their unusual and independent imagination? I think the first thing to bring to mind is they were both self-educated in an important way. Uh, I've always thought that one of the most important accounts of Churchill's own education is from him, from his book, My Early Life, the chapter called Education in Bangalore. Because he'd gone to Sandhurst, the military academy. He learned all about military strategy and tactics, but he hadn't read the classics. He hadn't had a liberal arts education. And he knew this, and he understood that if I want to be a political success in the world, I need to know more. So you might say he gave himself his own graduate course. And he describes in that chapter all the books he read, Plato, Aristotle, Schopenhauer, Hegel, oh my God, uh, historians, uh, you know, Macaulay, um, Gibbon, right? Long, long list. Jim, of course, can tell you every single one that I'm forgetting a lot of them. He did leave out Machiavelli, who, for <laughs> prudent reasons. Um, and he wrote something interesting. He said, you know, I got to read it on my own and form my own views. I didn't have some professor telling me, oh, you should think this way about it, or so-and-so is better on this subject. So he said, I formed my own views, and what I bit, I took. Uh, and I think a similar uh, thing happens with Reagan. For him, it's later in life. It's in the 1950s when he's touring the country for General Electric Theater, and he's traveling by train. You may know that Reagan was afraid to fly and very seldom got on an airplane. So to tour GE plants in 38 states, he set out from Los Angeles on a train. To, and that's long trips. And he would have a pile of books. And we know among those books were a lot of the early modern classics of conservatism, like Whitaker Chambers' Witness, Hayek's Road to Serfdom, uh, Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson, uh, Charter Subscriber to National Review when it launches in 1955. And he's scribbling notes on his note cards and working them into his speeches. And Reagan later on said, uh, people say, who converted me from being a liberal Democrat to a conservative? He said, well, I did it myself through my own reading and study. And no one would ever take him literally or seriously about that. But it's true. And that, of course, allowed both men to uh, say what to the conventional mind were outrageous things. So my favorites are, again, parallels is uh, 1976 and again in 1980. Reagan said, you know, fascism was really the basis of the New Deal. This horrified everyone. And my favorite response was the Washington Post news story that said, the Washington Post contacted several historians of the New, I new Deal who have no idea what Reagan is talking about, which I thought just, you know, a nice barometer of the ignorance of Washington Post reporters or of New Deal historians. They kind of overlap. Um, and in a Reagan, def and instead of I'm sure his campaign advisors have said, you've got to say you were misunderstood. It's out of context. Just make it go away. Of course, he didn't do that. He defended it straight up in September of 1980, saying, I had in mind, uh, you know, if you look at the New Deal theorists, and he named a few forgotten names to everybody. And their view was, you know, you want government control of private resources. That's the economic theory of fascism. He didn't back down on it at all. Uh, in Churchill's case, the parallel was in 
It's June of 1945. Isn't that the famous speech, Jim? Um, the Gestapo speech? Yeah, June of 1945, uh, the war in Europe's over. There's an election called. And Churchill says, of the party that he's been in coalition with for six years, you cannot have socialism in England without some form of Gestapo in the Labor Party, in, in which our civil servants will no longer be civil and no longer servants. And he went on to say, I'm sure they'd be horrified to hear that, but it's the logical consequence of the chain of thought that they have that, that, of any economic system depending on central planning. It'll just have to go that way, whether they mean to or not. Well, where did he get it? He got it from the same place Reagan did. Uh, probably from Hayek's road to serfdom, certainly in Reagan's case, but probably in Churchill's case too. In fact, uh, uh, I've lost it here in my notes. Ah, there it is. Hayek himself later wrote to Paul Addison, who wrote a very good book about Churchill's domestic policy. Hayek said, I'm afraid that there can be little doubt that Winston Churchill's somewhat unfortunately phrased Gestapo speech was written under the influence of the road to serfdom. So no respectable people would quote these books. Doesn't matter if they're bestsellers, but but they would, right? All right. So then you get to the Cold War. I, I started out by saying the conventional view is well, the Soviet Union's weird, but it's you know it's a it's a durable form of rule. Churchill said early on, as early as the Russian Revolution in 1917, but then in later years he'd say. Uh, the, the problem with communism is it's against human nature. It's unnatural. Uh, and Reagan said the same thing in the 1970s. It's against human nature. It's unnatural. It goes against the fundamental human yearning for human freedom. Not many people talk that way. At that level of politics, not many people talk that way. And we all know that Reagan's one of the slogans that was used as peace through strength. Well, that really came from Churchill. That was his strategy, starting with, uh, as uh, Lee made reference to, the famous Fulton speech that announced the coming of the Iron Curtain. That's the speech where Churchill said, we need to stand up diplomatically to the dictators and we have to arm ourselves for deterrent purposes. And Looking back and in his memoirs, Churchill said that World War II would have been the easiest war to prevent if we adopted that strategy. Uh, he said we could have prevented World War II without the firing of a single shot. That was Churchill's famous phrase. And then remember in the 1990s, what did Margaret Thatcher say? She said, Ronald Reagan won the Cold War without the firing of a single shot. Not quite literally true. There were some shots fired in Grenada, you know, our bombing raid on Libya, Libya being at least an adjunct partner of the Soviet enterprise. But, but she didn't, wasn't literally counting bullets. She understood. I think the Iron Lady had the Iron Curtain speech in the back of her mind when she made that statement because she understood the grand strategy involved and why it departed. But there's another part to this, which is, you know, the criticism of Reagan throughout those years was, Oh, gosh, you're going to be a Cold War moralist. That's going to strengthen the hawks and the Kremlin and make things worse. It's going to risk war, and it's going to make it harder to make a deal. And Reagan, and especially, I think, one of his most important uh, supporters and advisors, uh, William Clark, said, we think the opposite. We think by being tough, it's going to make it more likely we will get more cooperative Soviet leadership, which does come along with Gorbachev. That's a long and tangled story, but still the general storyline there is correct, I think. But in both cases, Churchill and Reagan, they weren't warmongers seeking confrontation and then going home. They thought that would be how you would get a settlement. What Churchill said in the Iron Curtain speech was, what is needed is a settlement a good understanding on all points with Russia. And if you know this, hardly anybody in America knows the story, but Churchill was always pushing, perhaps imprudently, perhaps too soon, that we need to reach a settlement with the Soviet Union. Otherwise, we do risk World War III. At the end of 1981, Reagan said the following in an interview. I've always recognized that ultimately there's got to be a settlement, a solution. The other way, if you don't believe that, then you're trapped in the back of your mind, the inevitability of conflict someday. That kind of conflict is going to end the world. 
So this was a man who had peacemaking uh, uh, at the front of his mind. But he departed from all the conventional wisdom, I call it if you want to use political theory jargon, modern neo-Kantian wisdom that all we need to do is have warm, fuzzy feelings and that will work. He knew that toughness is what would work, not warm fuzzies. And that's one reason why when Reagan would say, I'm for nuclear disarmament, nobody believed him. They thought he was lying or, you know, was something, right? Um, So let me give you two more parallels between the two men. It jumped out at me. In 1948, Churchill said the following in a speech. What do you suppose would be the position this afternoon had it been communist Russia instead of free enterprise America, which had created the atomic weapon? Instead of being a somber guarantee of peace, it would have become an irresistible method of human enslavement. Okay, better us than them. Then, if you know the story, in 1967, uh, Reagan appeared as governor, first year's governor. He appeared on a television debate on CBS News with Robert F. Kennedy. And Reagan said the following in the course of that debate. By the way, this debate, you couldn't find a transcript of it for years. CBS buried it. Why? Because by all acknowledgments, including Kennedy's people, Reagan wiped the floor with Kennedy. You don't find any acknowledgement of this in the great Kennedy biographies and so forth in later years. You can now see it on YouTube uh, if you want, but for years you couldn't find it. I had, it was great difficulty. I finally was able to track down a uh, transcript of it with help from Ed Meese more than 20 years ago now. But here's what Reagan said in the middle of that debate. At the end of World War II, one nation in the world had unprecedented power. We had the atomic bomb. The United States made no effort to oppose its will on the rest of the nations. Can you honestly say that had the Soviet Union been in a comparable position with that bomb or today's red Chinese, that the world would not today have been conquered with that force? Exactly the same understanding that Churchill had about the matter. And by the way, Reagan brought that up a few times with Gorbachev in their summits, much to the annoyance of the Soviet delegation. I that was fun. Uh, finally, I'll draw to a conclusion this way. Um, in later years, both in the case of Churchill and Reagan, a lot of grudging admirers, maybe not admirers, but people who grudgingly acknowledge their success and greatness would say, well, they were men out of the past. And yeah, it worked well for their time. And in Churchill's case, uh, this is especially the thesis of William Manchester in his very popular three-volume biography, uh, is that, well, Churchill was this holdover from the Victorian era. And that's why those particular virtues were useful and necessary then, but kind of obsolete otherwise, a museum piece. Um, and a similar thing is said about Reagan, that, well, he's sort of a person out of the 50s, or the joke was, you know, he'll make movies for 18th century Fox or something like that, right? That was the old joke. But an, an, an anachronism of an older America. And I think that's wrong in both cases. Actually, what I say is, I don't think they were men of the recent past. I think they were men of the distant past. They're both classical men. I, I like the way John Lukács, uh, the late Hungarian historian that Jim and I uh, know, knew a little bit, um, he wrote the following, contrary to most accepted views, we ought to consider that Churchill was not some kind of admirable remnant of a more heroic past. He was not the last lion. He was something else. Now, Lukács didn't say what the something else uh, is, but I will. They were the great souled men right out of the pages of Aristotle, I think. And so there's, there's a broader point to this that I always try to bring to students. By the way, I'll just say as a personal matter, it's a matter of great frustration to me when I hear young conservatives just coming up. I mean, Reagan's 35, 40 years behind us now. And they say, well, Reagan has no relevance to us today. Sometimes, I'm sure some of you have heard these phrases, they attack what they call zombie Reaganism. And I, I sometimes have long conversations about what do you exactly mean by that? Because it's usually wrong or incorrect and inaccurate, but above all, thoughtless. The point is, is that the kind of large-souled statesmanship greatness I'm trying to draw to your attention here of these two men uh, is the kind of thing that you can learn from any great statesman, Lincoln, Washington, 
Uh, and it, on a level of thought, it refutes the historicist hypothesis that we're all just corks bobbing on the sea, uh, uh, driven by the waves of history. And so another answer to the question, why were they different from their peers? is that they transcended their environments and their time as only great men can do, and thereby they bent history to their will rather than succumbing to the supposed will of history itself. So I'll close with two things quickly. Uh, there's the British historian Jeffrey Elton wrote, I think, one of the best phrases about Churchill. He said, whenever I meet a historian who cannot think that there have been great men, great men moreover in politics, I feel myself in the presence of a bad historian. And there are times when I, indul I incline to judge all historians by their opinion of Winston Churchill, whether they can see that, no matter how much better the details, often damaging, of the man and his career become known, he still remains, quite simply, a great man. And I think the exact same thing can be said of Reagan. And uh, so the two last uh, uh, send-offs is... Um, one of Ronald Reagan's principles that he learned from show business was always leave your audience wanting more. That's why his speeches were shorter than the average politician. In my case, I have a whole book uh, about the side by side of Reagan and Churchill that began as an accident. It was a spin off of my longer book because what I thought would be three paragraphs about Reagan and Churchill grew to 20,000 words, which didn't work. <laughs> and the publisher said, make it a separate book. So I've done that available at fine Amazons everywhere. And as my mentor, Stan Evans, liked to say, uh, my time is up, and I thank you for yours. Well, Stephen, I think you captured, I think we all appreciated two, two things that you captured. One was the humor, and you delivered that with some zest that I think Churchill and Reagan would have very, very much appreciated in a time of so many dour politicians, so much hopelessness. I think the second is that last point that you made, uh, that these men were of great souls and that made them timeless and uh, not time bound and that they, they really stood above. Thank you very much. Uh, would you thank him one more time? Well, I'm going to ask our next panel to go ahead and move into position. And let me introduce the moderator for our first panel this afternoon, uh, Justin Reach, who is the executive director of the International Churchill Society. Welcome. Eric, thank you for the introduction. And as uh, Eric said initially, there are no breaks, so we're just going. <laughs> so very quick introduction, <laughs> thank you, which is great. And Stephen, um, what a wonderful, wonderful uh, keynote and an even better tie. I don't know if you've seen Stephen's tie. <laughs> it has Churchill smoking a cigar. Uh, the International Church Society used to sell these cigars. I think actually Tim Riley's museum in Fulton, Missouri continues to sell the, cigar, the, the tie. So I encourage you to, to go online and buy one. Um, you know, one quibble, Stephen, of that is you mentioned the age of current leaders, I actually think 82 is the new 65. So, so I, I think we should, <laughs> we should give credit where it's due. So everyone, my name is Justin Reich. Um, I'm the executive director of the International Churchill Society and the director of what's known as the National Churchill Leadership Center at George Washington University. The society is a global membership organization dedicated to promoting the continuing relevance of Sir Winston Churchill but also advocating for the values that he embodied, mainly those of freedom, democracy, and human rights. And many thanks are due to the, our hosts, the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, for hosting this symposium. Um, and I also want to thank the panelists whom I will shortly introduce. And thanks are also due uh, to Elizabeth Spalding, the chair of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, and Ken Pope, the CEO of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, and certainly not to of the foundation who has done the grunt work, both imaginative and rote, to make this event happen. Um, and thank you all for attending today. It's very much, it's, it's wonderful to see so many people here. So let me begin by saying, and this is kind of uh, hedging my bets, Winston Churchill said a lot of things about many topics. And Bolshevism, what he called Bolshevism, and then of course communism, and of course socialism, you know, certainly is a topic that he, he, he spoke much about. So the panel that I have the privilege of moderating is titled Wooing a Crocodile, 
which will detail Churchill's lifelong opposition to communism. And for fun, here's the full quote of that. Trying to maintain good relations with a communist is like wooing a crocodile. You do not know whether to tickle it under the chin or to beat it over the head. When it opens its mouth, you cannot tell whether it's trying to smile or preparing to eat you up. So on a fundamental level, excuse me, on a fundamental level, Churchill's world worldview was almost completely opposite to that of communism and communists. Churchill saw and judged people as individuals. He believed deeply in the will of an individual to decide what to do with their life, and that by empowering individuals, the whole of society would benefit. Communism and, and socialism were simply anathema to him and, and his personality. And if anything, Churchill was a unique individual. He was both a nonconformist, but also a dyed in the wool traditionalist. And it all depends on the, the matter at hand. He understood that humans should certainly strive for equality, but not impose it. That was certainly unnatural to him. In 1926, he said of communist sister, the socialist, quote, let them abandon the utter fallacy, the grotesque, erroneous, fatal blunder of believing that by limiting the enterprise of man, by riveting the shackles of a false equality upon the efforts of all the different forms in different classes of human enterprise, they will increase the well-being of the world. And in 1920, he wrote, my hatred of Bolshevism and Bolsheviks is not founded on their silly system of economics or their absurd doctrine of an impossible equality. It arises from the bloody and devastating terrorism from which they practice in every land into which they have broken and by which alone their criminal regime can be maintained. When German radio in 1945 announced that Hitler had died, quote, fighting with his last breath against Bolshevism, Churchill jokes, well, I must say, I think he was perfectly right to die like that. <laughs> but this nice, quaint, straightforward narrative of Churchill being an anti-Bolshevist and everything that he said, did, and believed is actually not true. So Churchill also supported Stalin and the USSR, of course, at the most perilous time of their history. And even before the German-Soviet non-aggression pact and the full-scale outbreak of World War II, Churchill told the Soviet ambassador to London, Ivan Maisky, that in 19, he said this in 1935, he did not think the Soviet Union would pose a threat to Great Britain for at least 10 years. And my goodness, what an accurate prediction that was. <laughs> On April 8th, 1936, he said to Maisky, quote, we would be complete idiots were we to deny help to the Soviet Union at present out of a hypothetical danger of socialism, which might threaten our children and grandchildren. And then in March of 1938, he said to Maisky again, today the greatest menace to the British Empire is German Nazism with its idea of Berlin's global hegemony. That is why at the present time, I spare no effort in the struggle against Hitler. If one fine day the German fascist threat to the empire disappears and the communist menace rears its head again, then I tell you frankly, I would raise the banner of the struggle against you once more. However, I don't anticipate the possibility of this happening in the near future, or at least within my lifetime. So I'm pretty confused right now about Winston Churchill's attitude and points of view towards communism. So for decades, Churchill warned about the perils of Bolshevism. And don't forget, he called Bolshevism, quote, a foul combination of criminality and animalism. Yet he also extended a helping hand to the country at the vanguard of international communism. So I'm not going to answer this question. I'm going to have my panelists help me help me to help me figure this out. Um, and so for this for this panel, um, the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation graciously invited Ted Broman, Jim Muller, and Tim Riley. And allow me to briefly introduce them, and then I'm going to have uh, Jim Muller uh, begin. So Ted Broman studies and writes on Anglo-American relations, U.S. and British relations with Europe and the European Union, America's leadership role in the world, and in international organizations and treaties as a senior research fellow in the Heritage Foundation's Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom. 
Jim Muller is Professor Emeritus of Political Science at the University of Alaska Anchorage, where he taught from 1983 to 2023, and is the Chairman of the Board of the Academic Advisors of the International Churchill Society. Uh, his definitive edition of Churchill's earlier book, The River War, came out in 2020, 2020 and he's working on My Early Life, a new, a new edited version of Churchill's My Early Life, Life, A Roving Commission. And then Tim Riley has served as the Sandra L. and Monroe E. Trout Director and Chief Curator for America's National Churchill Museum since 2016. During his tenure, he has expanded the museum's collection, exhibitions, programs, publications, and underscored the continued relevance of Churchill's legacy in today's world. So please uh, join me in welcoming Jim Muller, who will have 10 minutes, and I'm going to cut off the, 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 <laughs> the, the, the microphone. And I've known Jim for over, over 12 years, so I feel like I could say that. So thank you. Please, please have me join. <laughs> yeah, well, please, Jim. Thank you. Uh, you forced me to speak very fast. Um, I'm not only honored to be invited to come to Washington, D.C. to talk about Churchill, to mark the anniversary of the speech that he gave 78 years ago this week in Fulton, Missouri. I'm also warmed by the opportunity to come here, which reminds me of what Churchill said about both communism and fascism at Oxford in 1937, almost a decade earlier. What he suggested was that communism and fascism reminded him, and here I quote, of the North Pole and the South Pole. They're at opposite ends of the earth, but if you woke up at either pole tomorrow morning, you could not tell which one it was. Perhaps there might be more penguins at one or more polar bears at the other, but all around would be ice and snow and the blast of a biting wind, which sounds like the weather when I left Anchorage day before yesterday. For his part, Churchill continued, I have made up my mind however far I may travel, Whatever countries I may see, I will not go to the Arctic or Antarctic regions. Give me London. Give me New York. Give me some of the beautiful capitals of the British dominions. Let us go somewhere where our breath is not frozen on our lips because of the secret police. Let us go somewhere where there are green pastures and the shade of venerable trees. Let us not wander away from the broad, fertile fields of freedom into these gaunt, grim, dim, gloomy abstractions of morbid and sterile thought. In fact, I think Churchill comes close to recommending Washington, D.C. on a nice sunny day like this when the cherry blossoms are about to bloom. He did unbend, though, incidentally, so far as to countenance a chilly visit to Moscow during the war to meet Stalin, and even later was willing to go to Fairbanks, uh, that's in Alaska, for a summit conference with Stalin and Roosevelt in 1944. But Stalin was too afraid to travel as far away as that from Moscow. So that summit was held in Tehran instead, and unfortunately it was very cold there. Um, Churchill was right in what he said to contrast freedom in the Western countries with gaunt, grim, gloomy abstractions of morbid and sterile thought. In 1931, he published in the Strand Magazine an essay called Mass Effects in Modern Life, describing the communist regime as one in which, and I quote, mass thoughts dictated and propagated by the rulers are the only thoughts deemed respectable. No one is to think of himself as an immortal spirit clothed in the flesh, but sovereign, unique, indestructible. No one is to think of himself even as that harmonious integrity of mind, soul, and body, which, take it as you will, may claim, claim to be the Lord of creation. Subhuman goals and ideals are set before these Asiatic millions. The beehive? No, for there must be no queen and no honey, or at least no honey for others. You see, bees are too sweet for communism. And so Churchill goes on to liken communist man to another insect. 
in Soviet Russia, he wrote, we have a society which seeks to model itself upon the ant. There is not one single social or economic principle or concept in the philosophy of the Russian Bolshevik, which has not been realized, carried into action, and enshrined in immutable laws a million years ago by the white ant. But Churchill's antipathy to communism goes back much earlier to the time when Russia had forsaken its Western allies against the German and Austrian empires during the First World War. As Lenin brought Marxism, Marxist communism as a plague bacillus, as Churchill wrote, to Russia. In his first sequel to the series of books, Churchill wrote after what was then called the Great War, which Churchill called the World Crisis, he wrote a volume called The Aftermath, and a quarter of that book discusses the Bolshevik Revolution. After the armistice, when Churchill was Secretary of State for War, he did all that he could to support the white Russian forces who were fighting Lenin's communists in the Russian Civil War. In February 1919, in a speech at the Mansion House in London, Churchill explained that the white Russians are now engaged in fighting against the foul baboonery of Bolshevism. 30 years later, in 1949, as leader of the opposition in the House of Commons, he told his fellow parliamentarians, I think the day will come when it will be recognized without doubt, not only on one side of the house, but throughout the civilized world, that the strangling of Bolshevism at its birth would have been an untold blessing to the human race. He even claimed it would have prevented the Second World War. But the white Russians, of course, were too divided, too ill-organized, too unfamiliar with the strength and importance of free government and parliamentary institutions. In short, to use Churchill's shorthand, themselves too Asiatic to prevail against the Bolsheviks. And the Western democracies, for their part, exhausted and bankrupted by the sacrifices they had made to win the Great War, shrank from taking on another battle against tyranny in rapid succession to the one in which they had just finally prevailed at so much cost in men and treasure. The anniversary of the Iron Curtain speech at Fulton helps us remember what distinguishes liberal democratic nations, nations that have achieved an important measure of civilization for their citizens from those which have yet to attain it and whose citizens still stand to gain so much from achieving it for themselves. What Churchill understood as civilization was to have learned to restrain ourselves and others from using violence and force without right, and to live in a society that takes its bearings from reflection and choice, respecting equal rights for all, even for those who are weaker. These days, instead of hearing about the achievements of civilization, we often hear about diverse cultures around the world. Certainly those cultures differ. When people urge that all cultures deserve equal respect and admiration, they mean that no culture is better than any other culture. That idea may sound appealing, since at first it seems sophisticated, tolerant, and cosmopolitan. We're encouraged to think that equity requires us to be inclusive and to accept diverse cultures. But a little observation and reflection shows that the idea quickly runs into contradiction, since many of those cultures are anything but sophisticated, tolerant, or cosmopolitan. Many, in fact, are altogether intolerant. If tolerance is a virtue, then it makes little sense to say that it means we should be equally tolerant of tolerant and intolerant cultures. If we tolerate all cultures, we still find that some of them do not tolerate us. Even if we decide to tolerate cultures like that anyway, because we're open-minded and easygoing, and they're far away and weak, we have to keep an eye out in case they begin to get closer and stronger. If we fail to pay attention, they may find a way to threaten us 
as Russia and China and political Islam do today. They may really get closer and stronger if we begin to forget the difference between tolerating something and approving of it. If we equally approve of tolerant and intolerant cultures, then we can no longer pride ourselves on being tolerant. Others are not comfortable or sophisticated enough to fall into this kind of error. You see many of them from countries that are violent and intolerant, trying to come to liberal democratic countries instead. We see this in America and our Western allies see it in Europe. You don't see much traffic in the other direction. People from liberal democratic countries trying to move to countries without the rule of law, without a free government, without any respect for human rights. The crowds are trying to migrate from countries that are ruled by brute force to countries that enjoy more decent regimes and offer a better life for their citizens. And that's a sign of a flaw in the sophisticated viewpoint that all cultures are equal, which has gained a growing sympathy among crowds in civilized countries who follow the fashion of political correctness. If there's a difference between civilized and uncivilized cultures, and people live better who enjoy the benefits of civilization, then there's something perverse, wrong-headed, and self-defeating when civilized people refuse to acknowledge it. We remember and honor Winston Churchill who understood this difference between civilization and a barbarous way of life. Drawing on lifelong study and an understanding of history and politics through his speeches and writings, he showed others how living a civilized life makes us happier and more fully human. By prudent action as a statesman and by inspiring men and women all around the world, he helped them find their way through a violent century in which brutal totalitarian governments tyrannized over their people and threatened decent nations. To Churchill's credit, throughout his life, he was not tempted, as many others were in the 20th century, to countenance tyranny from the left or from the right when it seemed akin to their own views. Churchill was not distracted by ideological excuses for tyranny. He was equally and resolutely opposed to both communism and Nazism. By his example, by his good humor, and by the irresistible delight he took in life, he points the way to what a human being can achieve. I want to end where I began with our observance of the anniversary of the Iron Curtain speech at Fulton, which my colleague Tim Riley will take up in a minute. I was born in 1953, and for the first four decades of my life, let me optimistically say, since I'm now in my eighth decade, or my 15th luster, as Churchill taught me to say, uh, in the first half of my life, the defining principle of international politics was the Cold War between the free world and the United States and Western Europe, and um, what sometimes was called the second world, but... Uh, uh, really means the so Soviet Russia with its communist allies in Peking and Pyongyang and Havana and all of what we used to call the captive nations in Eastern Europe. All honor to Churchill as the man who against the natural tendency of Americans and Western Europeans after the Second World War to look upon their wartime ally in Soviet Russia as a friend warned that despite our longing for peace and relaxation after the war, we were now obliged to defend ourselves against a mortal threat from Soviet Russia. And against the odds, Churchill, met, and Churchill managed to make that warning persuasive and effective until his own confidence that the Soviet regime was not perpetual was vindicated by the most astonishing political event of my life, I guess cautiously I should say so far, the fall of the Soviet Union. And I'm afraid the most astonishing political event since then has been the sudden loss of confidence 
in liberal democracy, extending even to self-loathing and a longing for the communist idea that has been so thoroughly discredited both in theory and in practice that's come over so many people in the United States and among our allies in Western Europe. It's that misfortune that the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, which has brought us together this afternoon, is helping to forestall with its programs to enlighten new generations of Americans about the real character of communism, which Churchill understood from the start and explained so eloquently to his readers and listeners. And I, I'll just end with this. I told our daughter, who's 32, and you know, who remembers Reagan's uh, burial when she was 12, and we were on our motorhome trip around the country, that I was coming to talk at VOC. And she said, what's that? And I slip of the tongue, I said, voices of communism. And she said, voices of communism, Dad. That doesn't sound like you. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Jim. So thank you. <clears throat> to stay on track, and because this is a comfortable seat, I'm not going to get up. But our next speaker is Tim Riley of America's National Church and Museum. And I will just say, uh, Jim, Churchill definitely taught us all how to live a civilized life, including a pint of champagne at lunch. So thank you. Well, thank you, Jim. That was a, a terrific um, overview and uh, I think a great reminder of Churchill's uh, lifelong relationship with the topic at hand. Um, my task today is really to talk about Churchill's Iron Curtain speech, which was delivered on the campus of Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri on March 5th, 78 years ago. Um, and I think in looking at the speech as a primary source document, um, and I'll share sections of it with you today, um, it will allow us to really understand that Churchill didn't use words, he wielded them. Um, the Iron Curtain speech is a set piece uh, in, in argument. Uh, it should be studied, I think, by every student and statesman uh, for how to craft an argument. And I'd like to, to, to cover some of those things uh, in my short presentation today. But before I do, uh, I'd like to put this in historical context. I'll take you back to 1945 uh, in May when Winston Churchill is making a shorter speech, uh, his victory speech uh, from the balconies at Whitehall, uh, declaring VE Day and the victory of the Great War in Europe. And it was a long fight. Uh, Churchill and the Allies won the war. Uh, but I think, as all of you know, uh, not long after, there was a general election in Great Britain and Churchill's party lost. He won the war, he lost the election. Arguably, the greatest statesman, most public figure, uh, voice of freedom uh, was out of, out of a job. His wife, Clementine, famously tried to console him. Clementine said to Winston, Winston, I think this is a blessing in disguise. And he retorted, it's very effectively disguised. <laughs> um, and it was really in the wake of that election defeat that Winston Churchill received a typewritten letter, a one-page letter from Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri, uh, inviting Churchill to come to the middle of America uh, to make a speech, the John Finley Green Foundation Lecture, an endowed lectureship at Westminster College that continues to this day. Now, I'm convinced that Churchill would have politely given that letter to his secretary uh, and said, tell them I can't possibly come. Churchill was often uh, very polite uh, in declining such invitations. Um, and that would have been it. However, uh, on the bottom of the page was a handwritten note that said, this is a wonderful school in my home state. Hope you can do it. If you come, I'll introduce you. Best regards, Harry Truman. So when Churchill saw that handwritten note by the President of the United States, he knew he would be back in the game. And he knew whatever he said from anywhere in the world with the President at his side, the world would listen. And so Winston Churchill accepted the invitation, made the journey uh, to Fulton, Missouri, and on March 5th presented arguably one of the greatest speeches of his life, certainly the most significant post-war speech that Churchill ever gave. It was a 50-minute speech, 
that had an impact on geopolitics for 50 years. In fact, still has an impact today, I would argue. Um, it began after an academic procession. Churchill and, Bo and Truman both received honorary degrees that day. And Winston Churchill began with humor. Uh, he said uh, he was very honored to be at Westminster, a place that sounded familiar to him. <laughs> he said, in fact, he had received his own education uh, in the halls of Westminster. Um, and with that humorous discharge aside, Churchill quickly turned the subject into hand. And he said, famously, this is a solemn moment for American democracy. For with primacy of power also joins an awe-inspiring accountability to the future. It's a solemn moment. Churchill said, there is an overall strategic concept in the Iron Curtain speech. He said, it is nothing less than the safety and welfare, the freedom and progress of all the homes, of all the families, and all the men and women in all the lands. That's the strategic concept, freedom for everyone, everywhere. Uh, and he says, and he's aware, aware of the timing. When I stand here this quiet afternoon in the wake of World War II, I shudder to visualize what is actually happening to millions. None can compute what has been called the unestimated sum of human pain. Our supreme task and duty is to guard the homes of the common people from the horrors and miseries of another war. So Churchill quickly uh, gets to the meat, heart of the matter. His supreme task is to protect against another war. And in doing so, he says, we must be shielded from the two great marauders, war and tyranny. Now, he didn't wax on too much about war in the Iron Curtain speech. I was well aware. Everyone was well aware of, of what that meant. But he talks about tyranny and defines it. And he uh, uses his rhetorical charm and says these uh, the, to his audience after saying that war and tyranny are the, are, the, are the things we have to talk about. We are all agreed on that, he says to an audience. The audience nodded their head. Churchill then said, we cannot be blind to the fact that the liberties enjoyed by the individual citizens throughout the British Empire are not valid in considerable numbers of countries, some of which are very powerful. In these states, and he's talking now about the Soviet influence, control is enforced upon the common people by various kinds of all-embracing police governments to the degree of which is overwhelming and contrary to every principle of democracy. The Gestapo state you talked about earlier, which in part led him to lose the election in 1945. Churchill said that we must never cease to proclaim the fear, in fearless tones the great principles of freedom, the rights of men, which are joint, the joint inheritances of the English-speaking world, and which through the Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, the habeas corpus, corpus, trial by jury, the English common law, and find their most famous expression in the American Declaration of Independence. Churchill begins his Iron Curtain speech not with a warning about an Iron Curtain descending, which was a negative, but with an espousing of the importance of freedom and liberty, a positive. And he outlines this uh, to an audience in the middle of America, not in New York, not in uh, Washington, uh, but where uh, the humble American spirit, full Americana, is on display in Fulton, if you've ever been. Uh, but he's talking about freedom for everyone, everywhere, and he chooses Fulton to make that. And he underscores this. He says, let us preach what we practice, let us practice what we preach. And so Churchill, in his defense of democracy and liberty, lays down the law, or the case for law and democracy and freedom. Only then does he turn his attention to the task and warning. Before he makes the famous speech uh, phrase or says the famous phrase, an iron curtain has descended, 
uh, he foreshadows it just a few pages earlier in the speech. He says, a shadow has fallen upon the scene so lately lighted by the Allied victory. Nobody knows what Soviet Russia and its communist international organizations intends to do in the immediate future, or what are the limits, if any, to their expansive and proselytizing tendencies. A shadow has fallen, an iron curtain has descended. Churchill is prescient. He sees what is coming as he did so often in his career uh, and makes this warning. He continues, from what I have seen of our Russian friends and allies during the war, I am convinced that there is nothing they admire so much as strength. And there is nothing for which they have less respect than weakness, especially military weakness. For that reason, the old doctrine of the balance of power is unsound. We cannot afford, if we can help it, to work on narrow margins, offering temptations or a trial of strength. If Western democracies are, are to, to be successful, they must stand together, Churchill says, in strict adherence to the principles that he's defining, liberty and democracy. And so a warning is given. Tyranny, the second great marauder, is the threat of Soviet communism. The Iron Curtain and its expanding tendencies. Churchill, near the end of the speech, ties this all together, the title deeds of freedom, the special relationship between the two countries, alliances. After all, the, the speech is not called the Iron Curtain speech. Winston Churchill gave the title, the sinews of peace. Sinews are things that tie us together, special relationships. And at the end of the speech, um, he refers to history, the great historian, he says, this has been quoted earlier today, there never was a war in history easier to prevent than by the timely action that just desolated such areas of the globe. It could have been prevented, in my opinion, Churchill says, without the firing of a single, single shot, and Germany might be powerful and prosperous today. And then he continues, but no one would listen. And we were all sucked into the whirlpool, the awful whirlpool. And Churchill says, surely, ladies and gentlemen, we must not let that happen again. To which he received immense applause in the gymnasium at Westminster College, where the Churchill, uh, rather, he, he gave the speech. And finally, Churchill underscores this idea of alliances between English-speaking peoples, uh, between those who value freedom and democracy, and concludes his speech by saying, if all British moral and material forces and convictions are joined with your own in fraternal association, the high roads of the future will be clear, not only for us, but for all, and not only for our time, but for a century to come. And with that conclusion, Churchill, I would argue, opened the, the, the path for the Cold War. Um, that speech in the gymnasium at Westminster College uh, had an impact for decades to come. Uh, and it reverberates even today. We talked a little bit about relevancy. Uh, Winston Churchill's Iron Curtain speech doesn't read like a history lesson. It reads like a headline. Talking about Russian aggression, uh, talking about some of these uh, values that are under attack in different parts of the world. And I think the speech itself, museums like this one, and panel discussions in days like today remind us all of the importance of remembering Winston Churchill, his words, and his legacy. And we need to teach it to those and for future generations. So thank you again. And in, in conclusion, um, there is this uh, uh, talk, really, and, and more, is in the first chapter of this book, which is called The uh, End of the Cold War and Its Aftermath, just out. Um, I also use the bookends of the, of, 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 of the Cold War uh, metaphor, uh, but I talk about Churchill's speech uh, at Fulton and 
Mikhail Gorbachev's speech in 1992, also at Fulton. Uh, if you're interested in those two men, Amazon everywhere. <laughs> thank you. Tim, thank you. Um, our final panelist before we will have about 20 minutes of Q&A is Ted Broman from the Margaret Thatcher Center at the Heritage Foundation. Thank you so much, Justin. Thank you for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to speak in front of so many distinguished scholars on both Reagan and Churchill, including Steve Hayward, Lee Edwards, and James Muller, uh, whose monumental edition of Churchill's River War I really cannot recommend highly enough. I've been asked to speak on how Churchill's views on the Cold War influenced or contributed to the ways in which Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher fought the Cold War. To do that means taking on the formidable job, however briefly, of assessing Churchill's views of the Cold War and the even more formidable job of following Steve Hayward talking on that exact same subject. If I could sum it up in just a phrase, Churchill believed that the Cold War was a necessary tragedy. He believed the Soviet Union and communism, even more importantly, had to be opposed. But not for nothing did he title the last volume of his monumental history of the Second World War, Triumph and Tragedy. Churchill continued to hope, as he put it in his last great speech, Never Despair, for what he called, quote, a top level conference where these matters could be put plainly and bluntly from one friendly visitor to the conference to another. But by 1955, when he gave that speech, his policy was one of deterrence, of peace through strength, of the unity of the English speaking world, and of waiting for a moment when, presumably, new Soviet leadership would give up the struggle. As Churchill famously said to John Colville in 1952, if Colville lived his normal span of life, Colville would surely see Eastern Europe free from communism. Colville died in 1987, so as usual, Churchill came very close to the truth. But notably, Churchill did not include the Soviet Union himself in this prophecy. As Steve notes, it's likely that if pressed, Churchill would have said that while communism would be transitory, Russian authoritarianism was much more likely to be permanent. So how did these views or Churchill's towering reputation influence his illustrious successors, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher? Well, there was very little direct personal influence. Reagan or Thatcher and Churchill met only twice. Once in 1950, when Margaret Roberts, as she then was, moved a vote of thanks to Churchill at a party rally at the Albert Hall. And then again, very briefly in the House of Commons in 1964, very shortly before Churchill's passing. And Ronald Reagan, of course, had very few opportunities to meet Winston Churchill. But both Thatcher and Reagan paid tribute to Churchill very regularly. Thatcher's archives show that she spoke or wrote about him just under 400 times in her political career. Now, some of these, of course, were only mentions in passing. But Churchill appears very frequently in Thatcher's words as a defender of freedom, an, an opponent of socialism, an advocate of Anglo-American friendship, and a defender of peace through strength. All very relevant and all very correct. But to me, the deeper similarity between Thatcher and Churchill are that both of them had a very clear sense that politics are downstream from culture and ideas. Thatcher's speech in 1996 in Fulton, Missouri, on the 50th anniversary of Churchill's Iron Curtain speech, is remarkable not least because Lady Thatcher chose to emphasize that economic freedom cannot endure unless it is founded on ideas of law and personal responsibility. As Thatcher put it in 1992 at the conclusion of his speech in South Korea, quote, the battle of ideas must be fought and refought every day. Churchill spent much of his life doing precisely that, even in, as others have reminded us today in the 1945 election campaign, at the cost of his own electoral success. Uh, no wonder Thatcher loved to refer to Churchill. But as far as, the iron, as far as the Cold War is concerned, was this a case of direct inspiration and influence, 
or was it a case of similar minds arriving at similar conclusions? My own view is that Lady Thatcher found support in ammunition and rhetorical fodder in Sir Winston, but that she arrived at her conclusions on the Cold War mostly on her own. From her early years in politics in the 1950s, she was a loyal Tory, so quoting Churchill came easily to her. But she had no need to be converted to conservatism, to opposing socialism, or to hating communism. She was, in all of those things, to the manner born. Reagan, of course, was a little different. He too loved to quote or mention Churchill, more than 150 times as president alone, more than three times as much as any other president. It's hard to imagine any other president, except for maybe Kennedy, proclaiming, as Reagan did in 1988, National Sir Winston Churchill Recognition Week. But Reagan did a lot more than just quote Churchill in passing. He often borrowed Churchill's rhetorical structures, and he quoted Churchill more frequently at length than Lady Thatcher did. For example, in Reagan's great speech to the British Parliament in 1982, he nodded at length to Churchill's statement at Fulton that, I do not believe that Soviet Russia desires war. What they desire are the fruits of war and the indefinite expansion of their power and doctrines." Unquote. Like Churchill, but unlike Lady Thatcher, Reagan was a rebel liberal. For in many respects, Churchill never abandoned the liberal creed of his youth. He was often charged with being a turncoat, moving as he did from Tory to liberal and back to the Tories. But it would be truer to say that Churchill's beliefs were constant. It was not Churchill who moved, it was everyone else. The system in the end revolved around him. He was the constant. Much the same could be said of Ronald Reagan. One of the most insightful truth in Steve's excellent book, Greatness, is the similarity that he brings out between Churchill and Reagan's political paths. Both ended up as conservative icons, but both started out as genuine liberals, and both an ideological and, except for Sir Winston's brief early flirtation with the Tory party, a party sense. But both found that their respective liberal parties had disappeared. In Churchill's sense, the Liberal Party genuinely disappeared, or in Reagan's sense, that the Liberal Party he belonged to had turned into something he no longer recognized as liberal. For both, the conservative path they then followed was right and consistent. In this sense, Churchill was the first neoconservative, mugged not by reality, but by the deficiencies of his own party. Reagan followed the same path. It's for that underlying reason that I think that Ronald Reagan was more directly influenced by Winston Churchill than was Margaret Thatcher. For Lady T, Churchill was a leader and an inspiration, not a teacher. But for Reagan, who had a lot to learn about free economies and free societies, and who spent a good deal of his time in the 1950s reading, Churchill was more directly instructive. This accounts, I think, for the otherwise curious fact that Reagan employs Churchill in ways that are often a lot more substantial than Margaret Thatcher did. The great distinction between Churchill and Reagan, and here I part company perhaps just a bit with Steve Hayward, is what they thought about the ending of the Cold War. We can only really guess at what Churchill saw, thought or said about this, but I simply cannot imagine Churchill ever saying, as Reagan famously said to Richard Allen in 1977, my theory of the Cold War is we win and they lose. What do you think about that? Yes, in practice, Reagan, Churchill, and Thatcher did have similar ideas about the ending of the Cold War. A new Soviet leadership would emerge, there would be summit meetings, an agreement would be struck, and the Cold War would end. And that's pretty much the way it ended up happening. But Churchill's vision of this process was a good deal more top down. Churchill's attitude towards the ending of the Cold War, at least as far as we can make it out, involved the ending of Soviet control over Eastern Europe and an end of Soviet efforts to revolutionize the rest of the world. But this might very well have been fully compatible with, and even perhaps best achieved through negotiations with, a Gorbachev-style figure who turned into, or even was, a Putin-style figure as well. 
It was this emphasis on personal diplomacy that Churchill thought was so important that annoyed President Eisenhower and brought Churchill's own cabinet colleagues to the brink of madness in 1953. Scholars in retrospect tend to praise Churchill for trying to resolve the Cold War or even as a forerunner of detente. But they tend to gloss over the fact that Churchill's vision of attempting to negotiate an end to the Cold War before the Soviet Union had recognized defeat was neither realistic nor likely to free anyone. Reagan's approach, perhaps not surprisingly, was a bit sunnier. He fully accepted the need to fight and win a battle of ideas. He believed in peace through strength and the need for negotiations. But at the end, he saw something a bit simpler. Whereas Churchill wanted peace, Reagan wanted peace, yes, but peace through victory. Thatcher eventually accepted that, and indeed, at least in public, became as cheerily optimistic as Reagan in the early 1990s. But Thatcher's own natural approach was a bit more skeptical. Recall, for example, her concerns about German reunification in 1990. Like Churchill, she was very cautious about the underlying natures of foreign cultures and deeply aware of geopolitical realities. Just as Churchill during World War II did not want to be left alone in Europe with the bear at the end of the war, Thatcher did not want to be left alone in Europe with a unified Germany at the end of the Cold War. Whether these nations were good, bad, or indifferent, they were simply too large and too powerful for comfort. So paradoxically, Lady Thatcher followed more closely in Churchill's line because, to put it simply, she was an English Tory, which is what he became. But as a result, she was less directly influenced by him. She didn't need Churchill's example to find Churchill's truths. Reagan hewed a little bit less closely to Churchill, though very closely in most of the things that mattered, but he learned more from Churchill simply because he had more to learn in general. It's always a mistake for anyone to say what Churchill would have done in circumstances that Churchill himself did not live through. None of us have his genius. I've made that mistake several times in these, re these remarks myself. Churchill, Reagan, and Thatcher all could only react to what was in front of them at the time. And it's a sign of the genius they shared. And yes, the inspiration that both Reagan and Thatcher did take from Churchill and from each other that they arrived at such similar answers to such great problems across the course of so many decades. Thank you very much. Ted, um, <clears throat> thank you very much. And thank all the, the other panelists, Tim and Jim. Um, I believe we have some roving microphones. Is that correct? OK. And your name, ma'am, with the microphone? Okay, Colleen, if you raise your hand, Colleen will try to get to you. We have about 17 minutes. Um, Colleen, there's this gentleman right here in the front. And what we're going to do is I'll, I'll pick names out if you don't mind, pick hands, and then I'm going to ask the last question. That's, that's my prerogative. So, yes, Colleen, please. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. I'm Chris Orr, uh, formerly senior defense editor for 1945, now publisher of my own Patreon page called uh, The Arsenal of Democracy. See what I did there? Uh, proud monthly donor to the OC and also donor to the Churchill War Rooms in London, a tour I highly recommend to those who have not taken that tour. Uh, speaking of the De Arsenal Democracy and my very deliberate parody of that FDRism, that's a segue to my question. We all know that FDR had a close personal friendship with Churchill in spite of FDR's you know, New Deal liberalism contrasting with church conservatism. The flip side, as Bill O'Reilly talked about his, book, about his book, Killing Patton, is that FDR foolishly thought of Stalin as a personal friend. He would address him as my dear Mr. Stalin. So my question is, given that first half of that equation, you no know, Churchill's French with FDR, any record that Churchill ever tried to you know, dissuade FDR of his delusions about Stalin's friendship. Any, in other words, any uh, evidence that Churchill tried to basically talk some sense in FDR about Stalin's uh, true nature. Thank you. Thank you. Um, which, uh, which one of my esteemed guests would like to raise their hand? Jim Muller. Well, Jim, press the button. Thank you. I, I would just say that the time when that happened the most was at Yalta, and 
that was a time when FDR was no longer really able to change his mind or um, think fully about what was going to happen after the war was over. And um, Churchill reflects that, but only up to a certain point in the last volume of his Second World War memoirs, um, Triumph and Tragedy. And it has to do with the tragedy that left um, Eastern Europe as captive nations. But I think um, Roosevelt um, perhaps was more optimistic about what might be able to be done with a man like Stalin. And Churchill tried to show him uh, by what Stalin had done and said what the dangers would be and just didn't succeed. And I can add, you know, after President Roosevelt's death and Truman came on board, invited Churchill to Fulton, um, the reaction from Eleanor to the Iron Curtain speech, she hated it. Yep. She hated it. She thought she was one crying, you know, Churchill's the warmonger uh, and others. I mean, that was that was perhaps telling, too, that, um, you know, I, I agree with Jim. I think Roosevelt probably saw uh, a chance to work with Stalin. Um, Churchill was more shrewd, I think, and, and saw Stalin for for what he was. And that goes back to what you were saying, you know, early on in, in your talk, Jim, you know, Churchill's relationship with Bolshevism, as he called it, you know, went back decades, long before Stalin and, um, and, and warned of it long, long ago. So I, I think that's, that's telling. Thank you. Ted. I'm not sure there's any subject on which, on which Winston Churchill says more different things than he does about Joseph Stalin and the opportunities of summit diplomacy. You can find a quote to support any point of view you care to take on this. Uh, I think Churchill combines, but not very comfortably, a, a deep instinctive loathing of communism and Bolshevism, tremendous awareness of Russian authoritarianism, uh, but also mixes in a belief in his, Churchill's own personal indispensability and his ability to win over people to his point of view, along with several other. I mean, there's a huge range of considerations. And depending on which one Churchill is the most moved by a particular moment, you can find a quote that expresses that point of view. But he he wouldn't Except at Yalta, the idea that he would have had a knockdown, drag out fight with FDR over the nature of Stalin's monster, you know, and as an absolute monster, got to win the war. Um, and that, that to Churchill is so overwhelmingly important that he's willing to swallow a great many things that he doesn't like for the sake of achieving that end. It's not glorious, but it's very necessary. Colleen, there's a gentleman in the uh, exquisite purple tie. If you would bring that up here, please. Excuse me, I understand at Yalta, uh, Churchill was undercut by some of FDR's uh, staff aides who were Marxist leaning. Is that correct? Well, it's certainly true that there were a number of people in the State Department and elsewhere who were, um, as time and the brief partial openings of the Russian archives have shown, were very much influenced by um, communist ideas. And uh, a number of books have been written which open up this subject. One of the good ones is by Lou Lehrman. Um, which I can recommend on that. Um, but, you know, that was only one strain of American politics and even American Democratic Party politics. And it was one that was weaker by virtue of having to be concealed and, and um, sub rosa. 
And so I, I think sometimes the strength of that in practical terms has been exaggerated by people who don't fully understand the necessity that my colleague Ted was just talking about. Um, so much of winning the war depended on preserving that Eastern Front, where for so long in Europe, most of the casualties were among the Red Army. And of course, all sorts of American support went to the Soviet Union through Alaska. Um, it was a long supply line, but it was a lot safer than the northern route uh, north of Norway. Um, we just had to do that to win the war. Thank you, Jim. There's a calling. Uh, why don't you start with him all the way in the back? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm Sven Kramer. I worked with uh, President Reagan for seven years in the White House, and I worked with three other presidents there as well. I was struck when I worked with him and when I read his works later on also, that he often referred to divine providence as the, I would say, underlying part of the historical arc that secular progressives don't seem to know about or ever invoke. And uh, I'm curious whether Mr. Churchill, whose works I've also read but never worked with, at a personal level at least, also believed that divine providence uh, would help those who fought tyranny and war, and that the eventual outcome of all that work would not depend entirely on his personal or even his nation's or even their allies' work, but needed and could uh, be helped by the invocation uh, and the presence of divine providence. Now, our founding fathers understood this much better than anybody who is allowed to speak today speaks about it, but I would like your views on that. I think that's a very important question. Um, the, the whole question of Churchill's religion is something that uh, people have talked about quietly for quite a long time and have begun to talk about more publicly recently. And there are very contrary views on that. What can't be denied is that um, if you go to the evidence, which is chiefly in things Churchill said and wrote, he was very concerned and interested in um, the parts of human life that don't come to us on account of our own choices. Um, and uh, in thinking about the, the roots of that, one thing that's very important is um, the divine provision for us or providence um, from a from a, a not a point of view that doesn't rely completely on you know revelation what one can say is not all the things that belong to human beings are things we've created for ourselves and Churchill was very very interested in the question of human nature what it was like and how it both allowed and constrained the choices we could make. And one of the things that struck him most forcibly was that communist ideology was based on the idea of human beings as material beings uh, who did not have the ability to control their own future or to make their own choices. And he thought that was simply wrong. It was simply an intellectual error to think that human beings were beings like that. And that was the thing that gave him the greatest confidence that in the end, communism wouldn't survive. Jim, thank you. Ted, please. Again, Churchill says many things on this subject, not all of them easy to reconcile. Uh, he often refers to a sense of providence when he himself escapes uh, injury on the battlefield. Uh, he, he perhaps most famously refers to a providential sense when he becomes prime minister in 1940, 
he alludes the feeling of having been saved for this particular moment. But then on the other hand, and I, I have to use this anecdote, he was at one point approached by a lady at a garden party and who praised him for being a pillar of the Church of England. And Churchill leaned over and said, Madam, I am a flying buttress. I support it from the outside. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I think he had a tremendous sense of providence, but I don't think he was a particularly religiously doctrinaire person or a terribly regular churchgoer in the sort of conventional sense. Uh, in that regard, he was rather like Abraham Lincoln, um, who, who had similar sorts of attitudes. But he knew the King James Bible extremely well. After all, he had gone to chapel three times a day when he was a student at Harrow. And, you know, in his writings, in his speeches, he refers to Christian civilization. But I don't think that's such a difference in his mind to, to religious uh, Christianity. So one more question, and Colin, I think you had a qu fantastic. So we'll do your last question, and then I'm going to ask the panelists a question each end. Hi, thank you all for your very interesting talks. Um, I was just wondering if Churchill ever said anything interesting during those four years when the U.S. had a nuclear monopoly, uh, whether he had expressed any interesting views about um, the applicability to U.S. strategic interests uh, during those the late 1940s. Thank you. Why don't, Ted, why don't you start? Well, he said a ton of interesting things uh, on this subject uh, throughout the, throughout those four or so years. Uh, I'll, I'll just pick out one that strikes me as important, and then and then my distinguished panelists can add on what what they think is most interesting. Uh, Churchill thought Britain needed the bomb. Um, he argued for close Anglo-American cooperation, uh, and that certainly included strategic matters, but it went well beyond sort of conventional strategy. But uh, as he says uh, in his Fulton speech, uh, you know, I will paraphrase here, you know, the United States is fantastic, but I can't feel that we should rely on any other nation, even the United States. We need the bomb ourselves. And nothing shocks Churchill more than when he comes back into Downing Street for his second spell as prime minister to discover that Clement Attlee and the Labour government have actually set all of this in motion, and Britain is going to Britain is getting the bomb. He's he's struck dumb that Labour has actually followed his prescriptions, which, from his and their point of view, were very sensible. And in the Iron Curtain speech itself, Churchill is very clear that the Soviets should not get it. I mean, he was very, very clear and knew the threat. I mean, he he, he was very, very concerned with that. Um, it's much more than Iron Curtain and our, you know, and a fully armed uh, arsenal behind the Iron Curtain for Churchill was was really, really a concern. Uh, on the other hand, Churchill expected that the Soviet Union would get the bomb. And therefore, he thought that there was a relatively short period after World War II when the Western allies were the only ones who uh, had to do with the bomb. Um, Britain, of course, had done a lot of the initial research, which the Americans took much further into fruition with the explosion in, in 1945 and then the use of the bombs in Japan. And um, Churchill thought that the reason this whole question we've been talking about was so urgent was that um, we had to do the things in the four or five years before the Soviet Union also got the bomb to prevent them from uh, having any quality of strength, which he thought was a, a, a real danger. So we have about 90 seconds. I'm going to ask um, <clears throat> all of you for a succinct answer on this. Um, and it goes back to my, to my opening remarks. I mean, you've said this many times, and we've all said this many times. Winston Churchill said a lot of things about a lot of topics, oftentimes contradictory. What explains his willingness, even before he takes the premiership in 1940, to pledge the support of the United Kingdom to Russia in the event of a, a, a war with Germany? How does he set aside uh, 
his incredible antagonism to, to communism. I'm going to start with Ted. Great men are able to rise to decide the most important question of the day and to elevate it above all others. Uh, Churchill writes that at a number of points, and when he has the opportunity, he puts it into practice. That involves making some very difficult choices, which is why it's a good thing that there was a Winston Churchill there to make them. Tim. Uh, agreed. And I'll build upon that by saying, uh, you know, I don't know what the uh, paraphrasing here, but the, the devil in the House of Commons um, quip that he made. Um, he, Talking about he's really Hitler was was the the, the greater of the two evils, um, and um, Churchill definitely recognized that. And his objective, as always, was to win the war and win it as quickly as possible. So that's what he did. Yeah. Lastly, Jim. Well, specifically, what he said was that um, if Hitler were to march into hell, he would give at least a favorable mention of the devil in the House of Commons. <laughs> So thank you all. Thank you for attending. Please, I hope everyone sticks around for the second panel. Um, panelists, thank you very much. Well, welcome back to our second panel today. Uh, here at the Victims of Communism we celebrate these two great speeches that both happened uh, the first week of March uh, so many years ago. And I want to go this briskly because we have an outstanding second panel for you. And we have plenty of time for QA as uh, these will be slightly shorter presentations. And I'm going to go in reverse order of our speakers. Um, our third speaker in this panel will be John Minkowski. He's had a distinguished career in public services in the United State Department and then is the director of European and Soviet Affairs at the National Security Council. But he's so well known in town as the founder, as president of emeritus, and as chancellor of the Institute for World Politics. Our second speaker will be uh, Elizabeth Edward Spalding, who's the chair of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation and founding director of the Victims of Communism Museum. She's also a senior fellow at Pepperdine University and a visiting fellow at the Van Andel Graduate School of Government at Hillsdale. And finally, the first of among our speakers is Anthony Ames. Many of you know him as the director of scholarly initiatives for the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation Institute. He also teaches at the Elliott School at George Washington University. So let me turn it over to you, Dr. Eats. Well, thank you, Eric, for that introduction. First and speaking, last in reputation on this panel, I suppose. And uh, it's good to see a lot of friends. Tough times back cleanup, as Ted mentioned, after Steve, after that was a wonderful first panel. Um, I was thinking about what to talk about this time around. We did something similar to this, uh, this panel last time, uh, this time last year. And we talked about Colin Thomas Kenna in the audience here. Um, should I talk about the Evil Empire speech again? But, you know, we've heard that. It's a great speech to talk about again, but there's so many other good, great speeches. What about tearing down this wall? Well, I don't know what we've talked about a lot. Okay, what about the Ivan Nagy speech? Just after the 40th anniversary, this will be January 40th anniversary, the Ivan Nagy speech, where Reagan really speaks directly to the Soviet people and detaches them from the Soviet government. Well, it's not really the sign that we want to make sure we get the Churchill Reagan connection. And he said, Anthony, you're missing the West Minster speech. Uh, so sometimes it takes a friend or a colleague to kind of pull you out of the weeds and get you to see the big picture, right? which is what Reagan and Churchill were both so efficient and effective at doing. The Westminster speech, uh, it really is kind of uh, the root of Reagan's ideological offensive the Soviet, against the Soviet Union uh, during his presidency. If you look at the Westminster speech, it word for word is almost uh, identical to the Evil Empire speech. I mean, they're very similar in scope. Uh, a lot of the language, a lot of the passages are kind of lifted one for one with swap outs for the British tradition and the, and the American tradition. Um, who was the one who said, hey, President Reagan, you should actually give this address? In London. There's a guy by the name of Charlie Wick. Now, there's some other people who are saying that you should get this address in London. But Charlie Wick is an interesting character because he was also Churchill's literary agent in America. So there's a nice little connection here between Churchill and Reagan on the Westminster speech. 
That's the thing. Why are Westminster speeches so fascinating in the 1980s itself as well? Because a year later, Margaret Thatcher comes to give her own speech in the United States. And she gives that speech at the Winston Churchill Foundation. And what does she model that speech on? She models it on Reagan's Westminster speech. In fact, among her speech writers at the time, they're all talking about we need this to be the kind of second strike in the uh, ideological offensive against the Soviet Union. This is our Westminster speech. So I don't want to kind of go on and on and get Elizabeth and John here to talk about some other interesting parts of the Global Empire speech. Um, but I do just want to draw this interesting connection and direction of influence. As Ted pointed out, you know, who is more uh, directly influenced by Churchill? Was it Reagan or was it Thatcher? And in some ways, Churchill influences Reagan and then Thatcher through Reagan. So it's a very interesting kind of transatlantic, transcirculation uh, moment. Uh, just a couple more comments on the, what is the difference between uh, Reagan and Churchill, and it is very similar. Well, they disagree on empire, certainly. Um, and I don't want to, you know, put a flyer or a here, but it's worth noting uh, that they disagree on the role of an empire in the world. But what they do agree on is the uh, power of words and rhetoric, of course. And what's very striking between these two men is there's this line that you've all probably heard. Uh, the diplomat is a man who sent abroad to lie for their country. I think you've all probably heard this before. But when I look to the event title here, uh, Churchill and Reagan, statesman of the Cold War, it got me thinking, what is a statesman? And I think the pithy truth is uh, a statesman is someone who speaks truth to the world. Right? In, some, in some ways, they're the opposite of a diplomat in that you know, kind of uh, tongue in cheek way of expressing what a diplomat is. Uh, so that is where Churchill and Reagan are one of the same. Very effective at speaking truth to the world. So I'll leave it there so we have time for today and I'll yield to the listeners. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, and we didn't coordinate, but this is going to work out well. <laughs> uh, I have to put in a plug for the Global Empire Network. Communist who has been mentioned uh, earlier, um, but he's near and dear to BOC, and he's near and dear to me and my scholarship, and that's Harry Truman. Uh, and in his uh, Truman Doctrine speech of March 12, 1947, so the year after uh, Churchill's Sinews of Peace, Truman called a spade a spade. This is a phrase that uh, Nate Sharansky would so memorably say of uh, Reagan with respect to the Eagle Empire speech, but it's very true here too. Without mentioning the USSR by name, Truman laid bare its expensive, aggressive evil uh, and advanced the strategy required to fight the Cold War. So there must be something about the month of March and great uh, statesmen speaking about the evils of totalitarianism. Um, I want to highlight Sharansky's insight about the core meaning of the Eagle Empire speech. So, as you may recall, uh, Nate Sharansky was a 35-year-old uh, dissident. Uh, he was a prisoner in the Soviet Gulag in March 1983. He was what was called a refusenik. He was that political dissident, he was also a Jew, and he stood for and spoke for freedom, including freedom of religion. And he and his fellow political prisoners had developed a secret tapping language to communicate through the cell walls, radiators if there were any, and even the toilets. Um, and since they were isolated in labor camps and punishment cells at the western edge of Siberia, they came to essentially know Reagan uh, because the guards sometimes allowed the, the prisoners to read Pravda and other official Soviet publications. So, not surprisingly, Reagan was a target of frequent denunciation. 
And I'm actually understating things when I say that. And I see Steve Hayward over here nodding because I know he and I went through the same fibis over and over and over for years and years in various research. And it's just one common condemnation of Reagan uh, after another in, in Pravda, Isvetsia, and other uh, Soviet publications. So then came the day, the day that Sharansky read that Reagan must be denounced even more ferociously uh, than before because he had called the Soviet Union an evil empire. So Sharansky tapped out the news and his cell block burst into celebration that the leader of the free world had spoken the truth. This gets to the power of the words and, uh, and um, Sharansky and the other prisoners truly thought that the world had changed as a result of what Reagan had said. And as Sharansky emphasized years later, this was the moment. Finally, a spade had been called a spade. Finally, Orwell's new speak was dead. President Reagan had from that moment made it impossible for anyone in the West to continue closing their eyes to the real nature of the Soviet Union. And this insight points to why the evil empire speech is essential to understanding Reagan and his approach to an impact on the Cold War. I will agree with everything that Anthony just said about the parliament address um, in Britain. Um, and Reagan refers to totalitarian evil in that address the previous June. And many would argue that it's the most important uh, Reagan statement um, that's an indictment of totalitarianism. For me, though, it is uh, part of a one-two punch that you really get with, uh, with that speech and then with um, the, uh, the Eagle Empire speech. But it is, as we've heard a couple of times today, where Reagan invokes and builds on Churchill's perceptiveness several times, and that's important to know. Um, also, the, this leads you up then, by 1987, certainly to the uh, tear down of this wall remarks. Um, and really, the three of these speeches together are key. And I would say, this is echoing some of what was said on the first panel about Churchill, um, we actually need and benefit from speeches like these today. Um, Americans and their allies, and those who were wanting to be free, starting to be free behind the Iron Curtain, all needed such speeches at the time, but we actually still need them um, today. We benefit from them today. We need them. Um, now, if we had to, if, if, if we had to pick one, then for me, the evil empire speech combines Reagan's understanding of politics and grand strategy and his moral clarity and courage. And this is something that picks up a little bit on what Steve um, was talking about. And all of it is in the context of regime distinctions, uh, self-government, the rule of law, uh, nature, God, rights, basically everything you can think about, all of it is there in the, in the evil empire speech. It embodies what Reagan always believed and then continued to believe throughout and after his presidency, and it really apprehends the eternal verities of politics as well as the particular moment um, in which he spoke. So it's timeless and it's of the moment, I think, at the same time. And radiating from Sharansky's insight about Reagan, several uh, points about Reagan's strategic thinking to win the Cold War are really featured in the Eagle Empire speech. One, in political terms, Reagan explained clearly that ideology drives totalitarianism, including communism, uh, and communism is based on lies and violence. Two, in moral terms, Reagan took the American and Soviet regime seriously and conveyed that the USSR, although a superpower in world affairs by dint of its military and its natural resources, was an illegitimate regime. And this is, this is something that Reagan does, that he's picking up from those before him, including a Churchill and a Truman, but he is pounding it home at a time where he's pilloried for doing so. And then three, in religious terms, Reagan knew, as he put it, that there is sin and evil in the world, and he believed that people, including the current 
focus of evil in the modern world must be opposed with all our might. So grounded as such, Reagan concluded in terms of strategy that the Cold War could be won and must be won. He didn't know when, but he did think that it could be won and must be won. He meaningfully includes peace through strength in the evil empire speech, and here and elsewhere, Reagan identified the factors that were undermining the USSR and helped to create the conditions for the Soviet's full ideological surrender. And this is the context in which to view Reagan's evil empire speech and its impact. Audaciously, Reagan aimed to free those held captive by ideological despotism. For Reagan, if the truth prevailed and the strategy followed, then the legs of the lies and violence could be weakened and kicked out from under the, the head and the body of totalitarian ideology. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think those were all terrific remarks, and uh, I'm delighted to share the panel with you, and I want to thank the BOC for inviting me. Um, I'm uh, particularly uh, touched by Anthony's uh, reference to the Westminster speech because that speech originated in the State Department um, where uh, there, were, there was a Reagan cell there, and I know that because I was part of that cell <laughs> that produced the first drafts of that speech. And, and, and one thing about that was that we decided to take up part of the spirit of President Reagan's broader political philosophy, which was not simply to fight uh, the Democratic Party by badmouthing it, but to offer a positive alternative. And, uh, and so one of the things that got put in that speech was the fact that we ought to, to fight communism with uh, with freedom and democracy, with legitimate government, the consent of the government, with the protection of inalienable human rights, and so on and so forth. And it was clear that this was uh, a, an ideological war. So anyway, I, I wanted to reflect on one or two things about President Reagan's view of the Soviet Union and, uh, and the Cold War, and that is that uh, there was a big split in the foreign policy establishment. It was more like 90% on one side and 10% on another side uh, about the relative permanence of the Soviet Union as a feature of the global geostrategic landscape. And the, basically the foreign policy establishment believed that the Soviet Union was a permanent feature of that landscape and would never change. And therefore, we had to reconcile ourselves to getting along with it. That's the policy of detente, because after all, if it's going to always be there and, and we try to do something to do Cold War things, then you know maybe we'll all blow ourselves up in a nuclear holocaust. So that was the conceptual framework for the policy of detente. And Ronald Reagan didn't accept it, and he opposed it throughout the 1970s. And, uh, and he believed that there were enough internal contradictions to communism, that there were, that it was a system that was contrary to human nature. That even though communist regimes had never changed once they had consolidated their power, until the invasion of Grenada in 1983, um, it had never happened before. It was the closest thing to political permanence that we were seeing in the modern times. And, and uh, nevertheless, he believed that it could be done. And so, uh, so that's one dimension of his view. Another was, of course, that he saw it as a moral conflict. As Sven Kramer mentioned, just as the previous panel had a quite this question, Reagan had a profound uh, religious view of these matters. Uh, he called uh, his policy toward the Soviet Union the divine plan, 
uh, which he actively worked on. Uh, he saw it, and, and as a moral conflict between good and evil, uh, he saw it as a, as a battle between truth and falsehood. He recognized that communism was all about the big lie, and of course, what is the big lie? The big lie uh, can be understood in several ways. At one level, it is a big lie about human nature, that man is not a material cog in some kind of a system, uh, a commodity uh, to be used and discarded uh, uh, when the utilitarians decide that you're not useful. Um, it, it, the big lie is, is also the whole notion that uh, there is no such thing as truth, except that which uh, is determined to be true according to the exigencies of communist uh, party interests. And then that, of course, is, is what intellectual relativism is all about, and, and that is a, a key element of, of communism. And then, of course, that segues us into the whole subject of moral relativism, which is the rejection of the existence of objective moral standards. The, the, the idea that there is no such thing as a transcendent, objective, universal moral order in the world. And that is another element of the big lie. And then, of course, there are all the little lies that have to be changed on a daily basis in, 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 in under communist regimes, where they don't even want their own people to know what their lies were six months ago, which is why in the Soviet Union you could not get a back issue of Pravda in a Soviet library, which is why I didn't do my doctoral research in the Soviet life in the Soviet Union, where I would have lived in a room, shared it, shared it with a KGB agent, uh, and would have perfect perfected my Russian, but basically spent the year, spend the year eating cucumber salad and, and being frustrated about not getting any access to research materials, which I got, by the way, at the Library of Congress very easily. Ronald Reagan also rejected the, 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 the establishment's view of what the source of tensions was between the USA and the USSR. The, the establishment basically said it is nuclear weapons, that the Soviets, in their entire mirror image perception, view of the world, saw, uh, saw uh, you know, simply that we think nuclear weapons are terrible, we're afraid of theirs, they must be afraid of ours, and so we've got to have arms control agreements. Well, Ronald Reagan understood that the source of tensions was the genetic code of Soviet communism. It was the very nature of the regime. And it was because, as Elizabeth said, because of its illegitimacy. And because in an illegitimate government, the central fact of political life is the regime's fear of its own people. And therefore, it has a huge internal security problem, which is why it has to set up a massive internal security system of dealing with everything, control of the media, communications, information, the borders, jamming of foreign broadcasts, control of the economy, control of internal travel, control of entertainment, uh, everything that you can imagine. And then, of course, that doesn't count. The, the, the snitches and the informants in every organized body of society, and the gulag archipelago on top of all of that. And so, when you are, when you fear your own people that much, you have not only to do this internal security system, you have to prove to them that you are so strong that resistance on their part against you is futile. And that's why the great Soviet dissident Vladimir Bukovsky said that the uh, Soviet foreign policy was designed to achieve uh, internal security purposes. It would, the, the Soviets would say, send a message to their own people, as some of you may have heard me you before, uh, attention, peoples of the Soviet Empire. We, the CPSU, can shoot down Korean airliners, civilian airliners. We can invade Afghanistan. We can send arms to the Nicaraguan communists right into the nose of Uncle Sam. And not even the greatest imperialist power of the world can resist us. 
So how can you people behind the, the iron curtain of the 200,000 KGB border guards with their barbed wire and their snarling dogs, how can you even contemplate resisting us? Resistance is futile. And so Reagan understood that what needed to be done was to show that was resistance was possible. And the first part of resistance was telling the truth and, and where newspeak could be banished forever because his predecessors were all censoring themselves. They would never say the truth about the Soviet Union and build the kind of pro-defense consensus uh, that, that Ronald Reagan built. And so he telling the truth, he, you know, every president when they come in had, before him was advised, use force, Mr. President, at your earliest opportunity in order to show the Soviets that you've got the guts to use it. Ronald Reagan didn't need to do that. He, he just needed to be seen by the Soviets as a seriously Chilovic, a serious man, which the Mullahs saw, even as, and which is why they released the hostages when he hadn't even finished walking down Pennsylvania Avenue during the inaugural parade. So uh, all of this ended up defining the strategic goal, and which was to bring about internal change in the Soviet Union because their external behavior was related to internal change. It was a, a function of their internal system. And that's why NSDD 75, the presidential directive on the Soviet Union, specifically called for working towards internal change in the Soviet Union. And who was going to do that change? It wasn't going to necessarily be the elites who had all sold their souls. It was going to be the people and Reagan's understanding of the importance of relations, not just with the government, the state, the party, but with the people was so important, which is why he gave the speech and, and why he did the interviews over RFERL uh, to the peoples of the, the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, where he basically was trying to get them so that they would move out of that attitude of fatalistic hopelessness, despair, futile resignation, and to give them courage to stand up on their own two feet, to reclaim their human dignity, and, 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 and to bring and to demand radical political change. And it all happened that way. Anyway, I should stop. <laughs> Three inspiring uh, uh, speakers on these uh, uh, Ronald Reagan and the rhetoric of his presidency and the ideals behind this. So, we're going to go to a time of question and answer. Uh, I'll call on you, and, and in 15 minutes, uh, I'm going to ask you to join the panel for the last 15 minutes of QA. We're going to let you ask a question right now, but I think that the audience might want to include you in the QA because. We really enjoyed talking earlier. So, first question. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh dear, that's too much really for me. I have uh, two questions for Elizabeth, drawing on her knowledge of Truman. Uh, I don't remember which speech it was. I don't think it was the Eden Lindbergh speech. It was around 83 or 84. But Reagan made the same reference to Harry Truman in the speech, the major foreign policy speech, I recall. And I forgot the details. I want you to fill me in. I think it was important to cite him for continuity purposes and some others. So maybe you remember that. But the longer one is about the Iron Curtain speech. And so you was mentioned before, Truman uh, scribbles the invitation. They go out on the train together. They're playing poker. They're drinking whiskey. Truman's written speech it says he approves it. Uh, but not an Eleanor Roosevelt done like speech. A lot of the liberal press, New York Times, really all oh, this was terrible. Uh, and then didn't. I'm vague on this. Didn't Truman also put some distance between himself and the speech afterwards for prudential reasons? What do you remember that? Because I'm very vague about all that. Man. So yeah. So on, on Truman, it is true. It's a it's a great description to read about uh, the train truck and to just imagine yourself. Wouldn't you have wanted to be on that train <laughs> with Harry Truman and Winston Churchill and playing cards and <clears throat> and hanging out as we would say now. Uh, so, uh, it is true that Truman read the speech, had the opportunity to read it, talk about it with advisors, said he thought it would do good 
um, agree um, with the thrust of it. He smiles the whole time. It's, I mean, Harry Truman did have that smile, but he smiles the whole time when he was up on stage uh, with, with Churchill speaking. Um, and then, the, even though public opinion in the United States had been finally turning against the Soviets, it wasn't completely turned yet, and it was almost as if um, Churchill's speech uh, made a lot of Americans think, well, I don't want um, somebody who believes in an empire, even though I agree with these other parts of what he's saying, this goes to what Anthony was saying earlier. Um, and so a lot of people rejected the speech. And so Truman does, for prudential reasons, distance himself a little bit um, for a while, uh, but he, um, he uh, several people in the American government say, uh, that it's because of um, Churchill not being an official. He was okay, you know, so he can say whatever he wanted to say in his capacity as a private citizen. But of course, you know, he's not an official uh, of, the, of the British government. And, and you think to yourself, but he's Winston Churchill. <laughs> he's 1946, and he's Winston Churchill, no matter what position he, he officially holds. Uh, so, but then eventually, um, uh, Truman starts saying how important it is, and of course there are elements of um, what we call in the vernacular the Iron Curtain speech that helped to inform the ground strategy of containment. So, um, and, and Truman had said some of the same things privately that Churchill said so eloquently in public. Um, before you know, before he's president, they have a, they have a similar line. Um, I mean, Truman's the one that uh, says um, he. he he votes against neutrality in the Senate, in the U.S. Senate, earlier than a lot of others do. Um, and so anyway, at some point, he says, um, well, I think we should just let them kill each other. This is the Soviets and the Nazis during the molotov ribbentrop Pact. And, and he says that would take care of a lot of things. Um, but if, if it turns out that the Soviets are pulling ahead, then you know, we really do need to, to kill off the Nazis first. And, and it's, I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he's saying. And so it's similar to, to Churchill that way. So he, he really does agree with them. And then there's this amazing, um, right at the end of Truman's presidency, he has Churchill, um, who's just been returned to the premiership, on the yacht, the presidential yacht, and they're out on the water. And, uh, and so Truman and Churchill are talking after dinner, and at some point Churchill says to Truman, you know, I didn't like you when I first met you, mm. and, and Truman stops smiling. <laughs> <laughs> and then Churchill does this amazing um, uh, uh, statement about Truman's contributions. Uh, and you can read it in a couple of secondary accounts, but also even the foreign relations of the United States. It's pretty, it's pretty, uh, Jim can say it too, it's pretty high level rhetoric for FRUS, right? I mean, you can tell that something actually quite eloquent and flowery was said. And the, the thrust of it uh, by Churchill is that Truman had done more than any other man to save Western civilization in what he had done um, in, in his, um, strategy of containment and things like the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, NATO, and fighting in the Korean War, even though that was a major reason Truman was leaving office, because it was going so poorly. Um, so uh, that's, that's an amazing relationship between the two of them. And then I'm blanking on which speech. Do you remember which speech it is that Reagan talks? I know this. I know this. And I was looking up some other things about Truman. I used to know it. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Do you remember? No, I to to but I know, I know there is some reference, um, and, he, and he really builds off of um, the uh, Truman Doctrine speech and uses some, just the way he uses, just the way Reagan uses the Churchillian kind of rhetoric. He uses the same kind of rhetoric from Truman um, to to build on in, in we'll find out. Yeah. And then we'll let him on. Can I jump in actually? You mentioned something about empire, and I realized that the point I wanted to make in my opening remarks about empire. It's a slam Churchill on empire. What I wanted to draw out on Churchill and empire was a similarity between he had with Reagan, and that was the prioritization of foreign policy goals. Reagan was in some ways so successful because he knew how to prioritize 
He wasn't so easily distracted about uh, uh, things going on around the world or even things going on domestically in that he had to shift his major strategy and focus. Uh, this is a big criticism of Carter that he was reacting. This whole foreign policy funneled into defeating the Soviet Union. And maybe on the margins there were some uh, less than brilliant decisions, but on the whole it was clearly an effective strategy. Churchill and Empire, and I don't think Churchill would have ever voted to get rid of Empire voluntarily. But the reason why Empire was so important to Churchill was defeating the Nazis and then ultimately again standing in the Soviet Union. Empire was the strength with which the British could use that force to, to combat those evils around the world. So that's how I see Churchill's view of Empire is that he knows how to prioritize Britain's indispensable role in the world in combating those two nasty ideologies. Great. Uh, uh, we'll start in the back and we'll come up. It's okay. Um. Hello, I'm uh, Donald Devine. Uh, I was ringing a set of the civil service as far as I remember. I was with him in 76 and 80. I had this video of Ann Blankowski here. And, uh, I'm going to end up asking you a question, but first I was going to say in a, in a forum dealing with both Churchill and Reagan and relating them to each other, shame you too, uh, why did no one mention what I consider his best speech? Not uh, this was like the most influential one, but the best one. Uh, which was in England. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. 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 The Westminster speech? No. The Westminster speech in June? No, no. The Guildhall speech. Oh, oh my goodness. Uh, at the end, uh, bringing it all together, yes. mentioning Churchill several times. I haven't looked at it in years, but I can't believe he didn't mention Churchill several times. He's in there, all right? Um, uh, and to me, it's just a perfect, balanced, serious uh, um, guy that was so important in our country. Um, but I'll end uh, with a question rather than a remark. Uh, you know, like the, uh, you know, back the, did you have anything to do with writing that speech? <laughs> Several other speeches, or some of those, some of those speeches came across my desk. Uh, the Evil Empire speech came across my desk, but the draft that I saw didn't have those words in it. Yeah. I think yeah. they have been doing the same thing. Excuse me. They kept taking it out. Yes, that's right. And so that was a, that was a fight that I had to the finish. <laughs> The president of the speechwriters, Tony Nolan and company. Reagan basically uh, did. Anyway, yes. My question is for John, uh, and it's a question for the, the near future, perhaps, or sometime further out, maybe. And that is, um, given the permanent uh, character of the civil service at the State Department, <coughs> If there were someone who wanted to turn the State Department in a direction that would be more sympathetic to the one you were laying out that President Reagan followed, what would be the best approach for changing the character of the State Department? Um, I have been <laughs> Yeah. 
What was amazing about it was that I happened to be an advisor to Larry Eagleberger, who in, in his two capacities there, one was Assistant Secretary for European Affairs and then Under Secretary for Political Affairs. And he had a deputy named Mark Palmer, who eventually became an ambassador to uh, Hungary. And, uh, and he liked the ideas that I had brought in, as a political appointee in there. I had just written an article which Foreign Affairs wanted to censor, and so I didn't want them to publish it. And so Policy Review, at the time Heritage published it, and it was called A Foreign Policy for Rayonauts. And I called for a democratic capitalist revolution in, in the Soviet Union. And, um, uh, and, and a huge part of this was to resurrect public diplomacy, which is the jargon term for relations with and influence over foreign publics and opinion leaders. And public diplomacy had been, been neglected by our foreign policy system and by the intellectual establishment and by the historians. And, uh, and I will, can make, I think, an intellectually defensible argument that public diplomacy over the long term is as important, if not more important, than traditional government to government diplomacy. My answer to your question is, you need a Secretary of State who understands what needs to be done and will and invest political capital in it. And when that Secretary of State comes into office, will not let the building make, fill his inbox or her inbox with so much urgent matters that the urgent crowds out the strategic. And the strategic is internal reform. What's the reform? It is to set up, in short, a, a, a U.S. public diplomacy agency that is not identical to the U.S. information agency, which was shut down in, in, in 1999, but to make it an integral part of the State Department, make its head a deputy secretary of state, make that person have the same rank as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff on the National Security Council, in other words, being a statutory observer, but none of that will do any good anyway. What will do good is to change the career incentives in the building. And what that means is make it so that 50% of all ambassadorships that are given out to foreign service officers and deputy assistant secretaryships and assistant secretaryships that are given to foreign service officers, 50% of those have to go to people who have spent a larger part of their career in the U.S. public diplomacy agency. And then you will start seeing excellence. And, and when you think about public diplomacy, you will also understand that it is a, it is, it's my euphemism for an entire spectrum of arts of statecraft, which we happen to teach at IWP because nobody else teaches them. You know, cultural diplomacy, exchanges, visitors, programs, information policy, all of that's traditional public diplomacy. But then there's international broadcasting. There is, which Alexander Solzhenitsyn called the most powerful weapon we possess in, 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 our, in the Cold War. The most powerful weapon are broadcasters, Voice of America, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty. And then there's political warfare, ideological warfare, information warfare, psychological strategy. All of these are in this broader realm of influencing foreign publics. And, and this is what Ronald Reagan did. He brought all of those instruments of power to bear, in addition to neglected elements of economic strategies, uh, which, you know, about which there's been a lot of discussion, uh, and, and military buildup, and all of these other things. Um, but, but that is the, those are the, I call it full spectrum, because our professional diplomatic corps simply are not full spectrum diplomats. They are not integrated strategists. And the, and the State Department is not a Department of Foreign Policy. It is a Department of Traditional Government to Government Diplomacy. And it neglects all the other stuff. Amen. <laughs> and uh, right here. And while we take this question, I ask you, Hayward, yes. To join us, I'm going to go to the podium. You're going to start. Oh, that's what I want to do. We're going to have a really confused people. Yeah. <laughs> 
was just wondering, how did President Reagan, as a private citizen, after the dust had settled in the 1990s, how did he assess his own record and his administration's record as you know, ending the Soviet Union in the Cold War? And before you pass that back, Sarah, did you also have a separate question? Did I? Yeah. We'll load them up. We'll load them up. Okay. Um, this goes uh, to anyone who can answer, but I would imagine John can answer it. Uh, what effect uh, did Reagan have on Gorbachev and his policies that he changed during that regime that led to the eventual breakup? Um, Do you want to answer these questions? Well, I could. Let's see this one. I think it's just very briefly. You know, Reagan had that famous sign on his desk that there's no limit to what you can accomplish. We don't care who gets the credit. Well, he knew he'd get the credit. He was that's part of his personal security, right? So he was modest about a lot of these things. Uh, but two things I recall is um, one from his diary when Gorbachev first becomes. Uh, premier, he says, uh, Arm and Hammer, all these people tell me he's a different kind of Soviet leader. I'm too cynical to believe that. You got to show me, right? So things warm up, and you know, these are story. By the way, is there, is there a good book written you guys know about the Reagan Gorbachev relationship in any great detail? I'm not aware of one, but I haven't kept it up. Um, there is a, there's a lot of literature that covers this. I don't know, I don't have a favorite one. Myself, because I I disagree with most of what everybody says about. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I would say that a lot of it covers just the sentence. It doesn't cover what you're asking. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in his uh, uh, in his memoir, Reagan says something like, uh, "You will like each other, and you will make some deals." But I I never thought I'd see a Soviet leader like this. So that there's that part of it. Um, <laughs> The other part is, uh, well, some of the interesting parts, yeah, the summits, but uh, this, this is a reference earlier. One of the things Reagan pressed Gorbachev on the hardest was religious liberty. And by the way, Gorbachev fought back and said, you know, I understand your own son is an atheist. And so he was, they were really sort of going at each other in a personal way. And, you know, some of that's deeply interesting, I think. Um, and then there are things like, I still remember uh, George Shull, one of the great accounts is George Shull's doing his classroom in the Kremlin, explaining to Gorbachev why you need to, I don't know, human rights and economic freedom go together, and you need to do both. And all this, uh, the accounts I've heard, and you were closer than I was, so please, and then I'll shut up really fast. Is uh, a lot of the State Department careers. Oh, don't do that. It was defended and won't be right. And he went to the, and the old University of Chicago professor that Schultz was. And you know, this is a long pause as Schultz tells the story. And Schultz says, Can I invite you over here to be my economics minister? So there was sort of multiple fronts of something that resembles the public diplomacy or persuasion that you're calling for, I think. And I think the deeply fascinating aspect of the whole thing that's very hard to pin down. Um, if I can just add on, on the like, later part, well, first of all, on the, what you were talking about, um, Nate Sharansky, who my reference, uh, he's the very first political prisoner that Gorbachev releases. And that's in 1986, and it's um, as a result of direct and continuous pressure that Reagan exerts. He never gives up on this, especially on the religious liberty part. It's, it's freedom overall, but it's, you know, it's very much uh, for freedom of religion. And then you asked about the, the latter part of Reagan's life, and I think the memoir um, occupied him, um, and I think that that is a pretty good presidential memoir. I mean, I know you quoted a lot, of it. you know, we, we treat it as a real source. There are some presidential memoirs and other memoirs that you have to make sure you're cross-referencing a couple of times over, but with Reagan's, you know, you're getting in. Um, but I think that some of uh, that period ends up almost being um, still uh, underdone for Reagan because the authorized biography of him is so bad that you don't have that voice. So he didn't have that voice coming out in the 90s and before his death. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of, that's part of why your book's important. Your book's really important. important. Right, it is part of why you write a book, but, um, or books, but this is something that you still don't have um, in real time, you didn't have what you ordinarily would have had in the in the years after president and before his death. There, and did we 
fully answer your question. Okay, just want to make sure. Yeah, right here in the back. I have something to add on the what did Raven do to Gordon Shaw? There we go. Um, and this follows on, on everything John said, because John on uh, public policy had completely experienced. Um, part of that was Reagan kind of forced Gordon Shaw to live up to his promised reforms. And if you look at summits, something that's not actually discussed all too often in the literature is the, the um, public diplomacy exchanges, information agreements between the guy who was earlier, Charlie Wick, and his counterparts in the Soviet Union. But things like Waffle on the Red Square in Moscow, uh, and Gordon Shaw coming to Washington, D.C., of course, a year earlier, and walking down the street, and being seen as a political celebrity in the West, um, or even his visit to the United Kingdom before he was. Uh, premier, um, these are all opportunities where the, the West is actually slowly coaxing out that political celebrity in Gorbachev, knowing that when he goes back to Moscow, he's going to have to live up to that. Right? He's not sticking to the same line, he's not sticking to the same script. And so it kind of puts him in this interesting position of having to live up to his word. Uh, so I think that's a, actually a pretty significant move that is well thought out before Gorbachev ever makes a visit to, you know, to the West. Um, and it's not just Reagan who does this, Thatcher also helps out too. I mean, Thatcher, when she goes on TV in, in Moscow, um, with a few Soviet journalists, you know, really blows the lid off things, uh, when she talks very frankly to the Soviet people about the kind of arms race policies between the US, uh, the UK, and the Soviet Union, and who's to blame. Um, so, uh, Again, forcing him to live up to the kind of Perestroika and all the other reforms are key here. I wanted to observe that um, this question is, is uh, there are elements of this question that are still a little mystifying to me after many years of reflecting upon them. Um, there were strong elements in Reagan's government pushing for the revival of the policy of data. And uh, the president's wife was one of them. And uh, on the Gorbachev side, but I don't think the president wanted to do the policy of detente. He had opposed it for so long. Um, Gorbachev, however, had finally been put between a rock and a hard place. The, the, uh, he, he discovered that because of American technological superiority, the sprint capacity that we had in the development of military technology, the computer revolution, stealth technology, and all of this stuff, including, of course, SDI, which had been fully developed, but which scared the Soviets to death, uh, they could not be militarily competitive with us. They had a crisis. The crisis in their in their domestic economy, consumer goods economy, started in 1917. The crisis in the military economy uh, was what was got it got worse and worse. And in order to get become militarily competitive, they either had to do a significant economic decentralization within the USSR, uh, but that risked unleashing uh, forces in civil society that were a threat to the party's monopoly of power. A decentralization of economic decision making could translate into a, a decentralization of political decision making, and there's only so far they could go. Gorbachev's so-called reforms were not nearly as great as Khrushchev's in the 1950s with his Sovnar policy and other things like that. There was a lot of rhetoric about it with Gorbachev, but very little action that meant anything. And I can go into details about this. Anyway, he was trying to save the Soviet Union. And in order to do it, he had to get a Western economic bailout. And in order to do that, he could not present to the West the picture of being a Stalinist type of totalitarian enemy. And so Georgi Arbatov, the chief Americanologist, said, we're going to do something terrible to you. We're going to deprive you of the enemy image. And once you're convinced we're not an enemy, 
the entire American military presence in the Atlantic, Pacific, Indian Ocean, and Mediterranean will collapse like a house of cards. So Gorbachev went on a charm offensive, a massive cultural diplomacy offensive here in the United States. The Red Army Chorus came here to the Kennedy Center and, and, sing, and they sang a mighty bustle, uh, you know, military songs and then sang the national anthem and the liberals and the, and the Kennedy Center gave them a standing ovation. And this is while they're carpet bombing Afghanistan. Uh, and, and so he could not throw everybody into the gulag because he would look like the Stalinist that that system required. And as a result, civil society started getting courage. They saw what happened with the Solidarity Movement in Poland. They stuck their foot in the door before the party could slam the door shut on them. Glasnost magazine was being published. Uh, and, and, and how could the inventor of Glasnost shut down Glasnost magazine and, and, and throw its, its editor into the gulag? Couldn't do it. So he had to be really nice to Reagan, and Reagan had to psychologically disarm Gorbachev to make him feel as though he could not risk the party's power by not cracking down on everybody. And yet he did crack down. He invaded Lithuania, he invaded Baku, he used poison gas on the demonstrators in the top square in Tbilisi in Georgia. He deployed poison gas to, to Moldova. Gorbachev the good. Gorbachev the good. Mm -hmm. And and uh Did it turn over for Yes, yes. <laughs> they lied about Chernobyl. Anyway, it's it's it is a very complicated psychopolitical situation in that relationship where Reagan tried to exploit his charm and his ability to get along with Gorbachev while simultaneously recognizing that this had a psychologically disarming effect. The two guys, in many ways, were trying to psychologically disarm each other. Mm -hmm. I have to say something on John's because this is a follow-up comment. On the SDI, so this is my, 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 uh, my high horse. SDI didn't work the way we all been wanted to believe it worked. Soviets were not afraid of the SDI technology. They were not. The Soviet military made a big stink out of it because the Soviet military wanted more, more rubles for their military. The Soviet scientific community knew that SDI would be deployed any time in the near future, certainly not before the year 2000. That doesn't mean SDI didn't work. The, what Gorbachev wanted to use SDI, you see this very clearly at Reagan. You see he's got the trap for Reagan. He says, Missiles are gone, we're going to disarm, we just need to get rid of SDI. And Thatcher says, oh god, Reagan fell into it. He's going to, he's going to go back to the West, he's going to tell all the American people and all the NATO publics, you know, I'm sorry, you didn't want to give up to SDI, and there's going to be a huge stake, and we're going to go sit right back into these massive anti-nuclear protests. Because nuclear weapons were always a matter of political warfare for the Soviet Union. It saw it as a way to divide the public against the government of the West, against the democratic elected government of the West. And Reagan thought to himself, no, I got this. And so when Reagan came home and he told everyone about Reagan and public opinion polls and justified his commitment to SDI, his commitment to defensive technologies, he actually wins the political battle as heir. So, so Gorbachev thinks he's going to split the US government from its people. It actually puts Reagan to the test and Reagan wins. And on the flip side, Reagan, beginning with Ivan and Ivan and other political policy tactics, splits the Soviet government from the Soviet people. So it still works, but not in the way that people thought it would work. But that's, I think it's an important distinction to make. It strengthens the job of about public diplomacy and psychological warfare. Um, thank you all for, for that. I think we're going to turn that into the conversation for a minute. Um, Yes, I, I, I think you'll be familiar with the speech that President Reagan gave, um, where he mentioned his church. I'm glad you mentioned the old hall speech. That was a good one. The other one was Spencer's speech at, at Westminster College, when President Reagan came to Westminster in Fulton to dedicate the Berlin Wall structure. Do you know that speech? I don't recall it immediately. Um, I, 
I mean, we should have, we should have led with that, perhaps. Uh, it's Next year. extraordinary speech. Um, on the first year anniversary of the fall of the wall, November 9, 1990, um, eight sections of the Berlin Wall were, were constructed uh, in, as a sculpture by Amina Sand, who's the Churchill's granddaughter, and erected on the campus of Westminster, right outside the Churchill Museum. And President Reagan dedicated that sculpture. And he talks about Churchill in glowing terms. Um, I highly recommend it. It's not that we, we have the, the probably old VHS in our archive and converted it digitally a couple years ago. It's on our YouTube channel, a little plug for the Churchill Museum. Uh, but it's worth seeing because there, President Reagan um, pays, pays appropriate deference to, to Churchill and his, his, his powerful language. Uh, it was one of the last public speeches. It was, this was late. Um, so, uh, it's, it's worth 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 reading to close out. Maybe leave them on more. Um, yes, or more. We're going to take the two last stands, uh, Dr. Edwards and this gentleman in the middle. Um, how is it that a Hollywood B film actor was able to do all this? And I'm going to partially answer that by, by sharing with you that in October of 1965, my wife Ann and I spent two days with then just an actor, Ronald Reagan. At the end of which, he invited us up to his home, and we sat there while Nancy and he were preparing some ice tea and cookies. But we were sitting just a couple of feet away from his library. All these books, hundreds of books facing. And so I walked over and began looking at the title. And there was Witness by Whitaker Chambers. There was The Road to Serfdom by Hayek. There was Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hassel. And there was a book which I had not read called The Law by Frederick Bastiat. I didn't know who had, Ronald Reagan knew who Frederick Bastiat was, a 19th century French economic liberal. How is it then? Is there some connection between this library and this extraordinary demonstration of rhetoric that you all have been talking about? Yeah, for what it's worth, um, <coughs> it may be true that Reagan, Thatcher, and Churchill are the only three politicians of that level in the last 100 plus years who all quoted Bastiat. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't even know who, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Reagan was using him in the 50s. Lee, well, you told me this for a long time ago. Why are you asking us this question? <laughs> So I won't say there's a divine spark, there's the ambition, there's all it's like all those things come together and no rare yeah, rare to have in the first place, and then even rarer when it can ascend to the summit that's right on it. We also bring back our two people that we're talking about today, Churchill and Reagan are both smart. And like you said, you talked about them being often self-taught. And and maybe this is what we want in our statesmen. Go Churchill! Go Reagan! Yes, I agree. Yes, that's the Oh, yes, yeah. Literally 50s. Yeah. Look, there's something I've always thought about this before a little bit. Probably just to proceed. But there's something to be said about skipping the traditional finishing schools of power in the United States. Bring it in the beginning. Was here at college, so speaking outside of the, the, the normal confines of great kind of language, it's even something very comfortable. It's never going to have a way of sensitive learning to be indoctrinated with that language. That's the same. I'm not going to have a way of sensitive learning. Yeah, this is the preparation that I'm saying. Soviet Judaism. Question, this is right here. So, let me just set up for the benefit of everyone. So, my name is Joel Oliver. I'm a student at IWB, a full rights scholar, and also a presidential scholar at the same institute. Uh, my question is 
Do you want to know today but that, first of all, that the war in this begins in the mind and the heart, and that there must have been a different definition of what a win against communism was. So, given this knowledge that we have today, and with, for instance, cells of communist parties that still exist in Africa, Latin America, how would you, how would bring it to a decent time, defined or redefined a win against communism today? So let me work backwards. Look out at the world now, we have a return of you know, tyranny, uh, is a classical sense, you know, China. And if you see the socialist, I don't know, you know, Venezuela, for example, Cuba is still with us, North Korea, right? We still have some of these classical, nominally communist uh, um, tyrannies. And so right, that's a basic human phenomenon, right? You know, the tyranny is the oldest political category of rule, I think you can say. So what we're going to say today, I think um, it is worth noting that you know, one of the dilemmas of foreign policy during the Cold War, and it was especially acute during Reagan's time, was but we, and this is the criticism always made of Reagan in America, is we're allied with a lot of authoritarian governments and we support them because they're on our side against the Soviet Union, so that would be the Philippines, it was in Nicaragua, a lot of African countries, right? Uh, and, and what was the Reagan policy? It was always trying to promote democracy where possible. He was always a realist. He understood that overthrowing Nicaragua on the basis of some just general notion of human rights was not an advance for the people of Nicaragua. Same with Iran. The Philippines, a different circumstance. Uh, Indonesia, that was um, uh, you know, uh, one of the major uh, initiatives of the Reagan administration was to get a democratic culture planted and working in Indonesia. I think I remember that right. Yeah, wasn't it in the nature of its uh, bubble fits? Right. Um, there's a big initiative there. And then a lot of the Latin American countries that were, you know, Argentina uh, and so forth, uh, I think what was the, one of the figures that Tinker Pack used to talk about this? The beginning of the 80s, you know, I'm going to make these numbers up, I don't know what they were, but 70% of, of, of Latin America was non democratic, and by 1990, 70% had become all. And there was a lot of effort behind all that, and I can't do much better than that on the fly because right now we have this view. What do we do about China? They're not, they're a tyranny, they're dangerous, they appear to be ambitious and aggressive. I'm not sure they're ideological in the, in the same character that the Soviet Union had during the Cold War. So it makes it a different kind of thing to handle. Beyond that, I'll put it John. I. I think that they've become more overtly ideological, the Chinese, yeah, with Xi Jinping thought. And, uh, and, and, and if you are a journalist, I mean, even, in, even under Xi's predecessors, if you're a journalist, if you stray from the party line, they send you off to ideological re education school. But George said it. Yes. <laughs> Anyway, um, uh, I think that um, Reagan understood communism, and this gets back to, this gets back to Lee Edwards' question uh, and comment, because he fought the communists as a trade union leader. And, you know, one of the reasons the AFL-CIO and the labor movement in this country became the largest and most influential organized anti-communist group in the United States is because they saw what, how, how, how dirty pool the, the communists play. And, and how uh, they, you know, they took over some of the unions, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO part of the AFL-CIO just a block away uh, was taken over by the communists. And, and the free trade unionists 
had to fight them off. And it was a very, very dirty fight. And Ronald Reagan saw this from the inside, being a great union leader. And he understood the, the, the utility of lies and disinformation and all of the other dirty tricks. He understood communism extremely well. And I think that he would be uh, today sensitive to the idiocratic nature of some of these regimes. Who they, they, I mean, China today has only one legitimizing instrument of state authority, and that is Marxism and Leninism, the Chinese characteristics. And, and, and they have an auxiliary one that's an informal one, namely the rising economy. But, you know, now youth unemployment is so bad in China that they don't cite the, 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 the youth unemployment statistics anymore. And, and so, you know, we're reading, finally, that, that they, they're coming in with a period of stagnation in China and not legitimizing instrument. And by the way, bringing people to middle class uh, standard of living in China is, uh, you know, is something that's only been enjoyed by maybe a quarter or a third of the people in China. A billion people live in, you know, hard scrabble, dirt, poor, uh, you know, circumstances. So, anyway. Elizabeth Anthony, the last comment. Yeah, I would just say to answer your question, um, that a lot of what Reagan did, and Churchill too, is still applicable because you can't put the ideological genie back in the bottle. And that started with the French Revolution, and then it went wild in the 20th century and still this century. Um, and, and so you still need to tell the truth. You know, so a Reagan strategy of telling the truth, Churchill strategy of telling the truth, that would be the first thing. And then I still think peace through strength would be the way to go. That's a multifaceted um, policy, a strategy. It includes politics, economics, military, culture, um, all the you know, full spectrum diplomacy included, includes religion, it includes absolutely everything. Um, and then you need prudence, which means even though it's five PhDs up here and a bunch of PhDs been asking questions, I think I would rather just have smart, well-read, self-taught people in charge to, to be prudent in enacting that kind of strategy. Peace through strength, that was difficult with the force now because we need to go to about 6%. Yes, we would have to be serious uh, about it. And we don't have to be serious about it. Thank you. 
in the more rural and agrarian classes in China. It's both the first world country and the third world country at the same time. So exposing their contradiction and speaking directly to the people, not to the CCP, which is something that too many of our governments have fallen into the trap of speaking to the CCP and not to the Chinese people. Uh, and then the last thing I want to point out, um, we can get into specifics on high tech embargoes and stuff, but that's not interesting. That's, I mean, it is interesting about right now. Allies. Allies, allies, allies. I mean, you know, NATO bashing isn't the way to go. And I'll just say that very clearly. It, something that strikes me how many German uh, uh, military bases do you see around the United States today? <laughs> or French military bases? Zero. And we need to understand that yes, they need to pay their 2%, and of course, in the 80s, it was 3%. I would like to see all of NATO pay 3%. That should be, you keep the pressure on. Uh, but we also need to understand that we still get something out of it. <laughs> we get forward bases out of that NATO arrangement. So allies, you can go to war to allies both rhetorically and uh, in, in physical hot conflicts. So allies, allies, allies. Well, we've had quite a day, and uh, there's a lot to reflect on as it relates to these two great leaders. Let me just say that next month we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Victims of Communism War Foundation. Uh, April of uh, the 30th anniversary milestone of the founding of the foundation. There's some, some other things to sign in the public law and things. But we're reminded today, not just of victories in the past, but that there's, there's work to be done. And we're part of the alliance, educating the next generation, uh, providing counsel here in Washington and elsewhere, doing teacher programming. So I want to invite you to use this museum as a resource in that fight, to help spread the word, to point people to our educator and our teacher's programs, our curriculum and things, uh, because uh, there still is a tremendous fight against communism and against totalitarianism. <laughs> but with that, thank you very much for coming. Would you help me by closing and thanking our speakers?